Hey, 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 Delio from Just Do Know here. Wow, wow, wow. It goes without saying, we are genuinely stoked to be a proud sponsor of this year's Ecom Forum and a continued friend of Irish Titan. Just Uno is one of the leading website conversion rate optimization tools that's trusted by some of the best brands and agencies out there. We've been known to be able to increase all the important metrics you care about associated with making the most out of every new and returning visitors alike. On behalf of everyone here at Just Uno, welcome to the Best damn e-com show out there, and we wish you continued success this holiday season ahead and beyond. Woo! <laughs> oh, I gotta clean up this mess now. Hi, my name's Eric Alder. I'm with Rebuy, and I lead the partner team here. We're excited to be partnering with Darren, Irish Titan, and the rest of the sponsors of the e-com forum. We're also excited to be with each of you learn about your business and what you're seeing in the market. Quick overview about Rebuy, we're a personalization tool. We make it really easy to increase AOV, conversion rates, and LTV. We do that through AI-based dynamic product recommendations, a really cool cart drawer called SmartCart, marketing tools like Smart Links and dynamic bundles, and integrating with your tech stack, Klaviyo, Attentive, Recharge, and many, many more. Looking forward to meeting all of you, and please reach out on LinkedIn if we don't cross paths. Hi, my name is Joni Burchett, a Partner Marketing Manager at Vertex. At Vertex, we help to accelerate commerce growth by providing global tax automation and compliance solutions for merchants. With over 19,000 tax jurisdictions worldwide, tax compliance can get pretty complex, but it doesn't have to be. Whether you're selling in-store, online, or via marketplace, Vertex can help provide a consistent experience and give you all the tools necessary to accurately and effectively calculate sales, use, and value-added tax at the time of checkout. Vertex is a long-standing partner of Irish Titan and are happy to be a sponsor of Ecom Forum 2022. To learn more about our tax automation solutions for e-commerce, please come find us. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, guys. Depending on where you are, my name is Quentin Montalto. I am the COO here at Shipper HQ. Shipper HQ is a proud four-time sponsor of Ecom Forum, presented by our good friends at Irish Titan of down here in or uh, up there in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, Shipper HQ is the app that powers the cart and checkout experience that customers see around shipping. Whether you guys want to just compete with Amazon and show off that really cool delivery date style, you want to make sure you're adding the right surcharges or discounts, all the way just to making sure if you're going to ship to either residential or a commercial address type, we got you covered. Please find Daniel at Ecom Forum and we'd be happy to chat more about you. Looking forward to the show, guys. G'day team, Damien here from Dot Digital. I'm super excited to join uh, the, the Irish Titan team for the Ecom Forum in Minneapolis. For those of you who don't know us, we're the ultimate integrated communications platform to empower your e-commerce website. Now we all receive thousands of messages through multiple channels. And one of the, the challenges for marketers is finding the right channel, the right message, and of course the right time to send it. Now Dot Digital helps this process. So whether it's a delivery notification via SMS, a marketing email, uh, a live chat on the website, or a back in stock product notification, Dot Digital is the ultimate platform to help you send that message out. Now we take that information and overlay sales data from finding the best new opportunities to build lasting digital relationships, turning prospective customers into loyal ones. We've been around for over 20 years and have been built by marketers for marketers globally. I look forward to seeing you all for some serious business building fun, whether it's in real life or virtually. See you next week. I'm Max Horn, the U.S. Partner Manager here at Fresh Relevance. Fresh Relevance is a versatile personalization solution that empowers e-commerce businesses to create custom cross-channel experiences with ease. The platform saves you time, integrates with your tech stack, and enables you to deliver personalized customer experiences across your website, app, emails, SMS, paid social, and ads without relying on your IT team. We're used by more than 350 businesses around the world, including Rip Curl, Leatherology, and Vanderhout Jewelry. We're proud to be supporting the Ecom Forum, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible. Hey, everybody. This is Justin Platt, VP of Sales and Partnerships for Switcher Studio. 
We are proud to be a sponsor of this year's Irish Titan Ecom Forum. With Switcher Studio, brands can now create stunning product videos with the devices they have in hand. No need for fancy cameras or studio lighting. Additionally, with Switcher, you can keep everything on brand with our asset library. Bring them custom text, add your logo, and even connect with multiple devices for split screen and multi-angle views. And this year, we announced an integration with Shopify. So now, Shopify brands can bring in their favorite collections and make all their live streams shoppable. That's right, live shopping is here. If you have any questions, give us a call or shoot us an email. And remember, if you can dream it, you can stream it. Hi, I'm Tom Earhart. I'm a strategic alliance manager with Avalara. We're a sales tax compliance software that helps companies automate their sales tax compliance needs. We're excited to sponsor Econ Forum and proud to partner with Irish Titan. Thanks. Hi everyone, this is Lizzie Andrew, Clavio's Senior Manager of Ecosystem Marketing. For those of you who don't know Clavio, we are a unified customer platform that focuses on email and SMS in getting the right message to the right customer at the right time. I am so excited to be joining you at Irish Titans Ecom Forum and presenting on customer first marketing. You won't want to miss it, so I hope to see you there. Hi, it's Eric Feuerstein, Director of Alliances with Attentive. We are the leading conversational commerce and SMS platform available. I am super pumped to be coming out to Minneapolis again for Ecom Forum. I've been coming to the show since the very first one, which seems like a million years ago at this point, but I've always loved the conference because it's almost like the anti-conference in the sense that it's such a comfortable and casual atmosphere and it lets brands that are really doing interesting things and technologies that are leading the charge share ideas and thoughts on the future of commerce in a setting that's really second to none. So I'm really looking forward to being back out there in Minneapolis in October. I'll see you then, and I can't wait to see you all again. Hi, everyone. I'm Kanika, an agency partner manager from Shopify. Making commerce better for everyone is in the DNA of Shopify, which is why I'm super excited to be attending Ecom Forum 2022. What excites me the most is an opportunity to meet you amazing folks who are doing interesting and cutting edge things to make lives and wallets of merchants better. See you in the Twin Cities. Take care. Shopping used to happen like this. Now, businesses need to sell in person, online, and anywhere else people click, scroll, browse, or tap. And they can do it all on Big Commerce.
And with that, welcome to Ecom Forum 2022. It's hard to miss that introduction, right? So thanks everybody, thanks everybody for being here and joining our frothy little three ring circus that's meant to celebrate e-commerce achievements to date and inspire those yet to come. Um, let's get started. Um, I'm Darren Lynch, founder and CEO of Irish Titan. For those of you who've been here before and been part of the fun, thank you for coming back. For those of you new to the fun, thanks for giving us a shot and we hope to see you next year. Let's cover the arc of the event a little bit, a little bit of a rundown so everybody knows what to expect. Um, as we do every year, we're kicking off with some content around leadership and culture and people. Laura Boyd is gonna grace us with that. And then like we do every year, we move into nothing but e-commerce content thereafter, okay? Um, so we have spotlights as we refer to them. Those are TED-like talks, eight to 10 minute-ish uh, conversations, high impact, e-commerce focused. Then we have panels. Uh, we have a build panel and a grow panel. And those are uh, returning from last year. We also have a hustle panel, which we used to refer to as our entrepreneurs panel. And we'll explain a little bit of the name change as, as we get to that. So that is the e-commerce content that will follow uh, Laura Boyd's keynote. Um, then let's cover some of the things that will help you get the most out of the event because it is important to us that everybody finds this to be a good use of their time. Time's valuable. We wanna make sure that everybody has a good experience here today, learns uh, around e-commerce. Like we said, it's meant to celebrate e-commerce achievements to date, inspire those yet to come. We like to describe the event as high content, high energy. So we want you to make sure to have some fun too and we'll get to some of that. But in terms of getting the most out of the event, as I mentioned, we have a build panel, we have a grow panel. So to encourage some experience around that and some energy, we have added um, some prizes this year for an exercise, which is totally voluntary, but who wouldn't want a chance to win a kilt, which is probably everybody's guess is what our prizes are gonna be, right? So you'll, everybody has color-coded pads at the tables, blue and green, okay? I'm a fan of alliteration, like most people are, that's how our brains work. So the blue pads are for build and the green pads are for Thank you, wow, this, bagpipes already create a lot of energy, right? So everybody is already flowing. Okay, so through the course of the day, write down your ideas about how you might build your e-commerce channel or how you might grow your e-commerce channel. Then after the official event is over and we're having fun with a happy hour on that side of the room, um, during that time, we are going to draw uh, uh, pieces of paper out of the build and out of the grow and whoever's name is drawn, so you need to put your name on there, they're gonna win their kilts, okay? So we've added that experience this year. Also, secondly, another new addition is our table of green, which is right around the corner. Um, we've added that this year in case you wanna have some discussions, small group live discussions around how you might wanna build or grow your e-commerce channel. So that table is staffed by Titans, <coughs> Titans, along with um, Jeff Buechler from Feedonomics, okay? So Feedonomics is an omni-channel solution, platform agnostic, and that table is where you can go for conversations about how you might invest in growing an omni-channel presence or building your e-commerce channel, okay? So that's new this year. Make sure to engage with that if you'd like. We also are using Slack, which we've used for a number of years now. So for those of you um, on the live stream, the live stream has a link to the Slack channel. For those of you here, you can check your email from this morning or any of the series of emails you've received over the last few days. I think that over the course of the eight years, we've figured out how to make sure nobody's gonna miss the event if they're signed up. So everybody had plenty of emails. You saw plenty of videos with my ugly mug. Um, that's all behind us now, but you can check those emails if you want a link to the Slack channel where you can engage with speakers, with each other, ask questions. That's where you can have the crack too. So uh, make sure to use that. Lastly, another new wrinkle this year in terms of getting the most out of the event is we have added discount codes from merchants, both past and present, who have been speakers at our event. So the follow-up emails will have a link to that 
That link is also going to be posted in Slack, and that's where you can engage uh, with the merchants who have added some discounts for all of us to benefit from. So thank you to those merchants. I know that there are some here. We appreciate that. I think that's indicative and reflective of the community that we've tried to build with the event. Um, next, some thank yous. And I am going to look at my iPad because I want to make sure not to miss any of these thank yous because these are important. So let's start with our sponsors because this would not happen without them. Many of the sponsors have been part of this event for year after year after year now, which we take very seriously. So thank you to those sponsors for doing that. Thank you for the sponsors who've joined more recently. Make sure to check them out on the site, engage with them at the tables out there. We do curate the sponsors. Um, these are sponsors who I think share in our spirit, not just of the event, but in e-commerce in general and the power of e-commerce. So thank you to those sponsors. We, we do appreciate it. Secondly, thank you to former speakers and panelists who are here. Um, and there are a number of you. We appreciate that. Again, I think that's reflective of the sort of uh, momentum we've built with the event over the years. So thank you to those, uh, those of you who joined again. A quick thank you to um, the Screaming Orphans. If you've heard any Irish tunes in the background other than Jimmy's bagpipes, uh, the Screaming Orphans are one of our favorite bands and they allow us to use their music. We use it a lot in a lot of our marketing assets and in the event. So thanks across the pond to the ladies and Screaming Orphans. They're four sisters who do nothing but argue in the most charming way on stage and then play the best Irish music. It's impossible not to like them. So if you have a chance to see them, go do it. My two daughters love them because they felt like that would be them if they grew up just arguing on stage the whole time. A special thank you and shout out to Anna Rosner. I saw her over here somewhere right there. So a round of applause to Anna right now, please. Anna is with SNS Design, who we have used for a number of years for our sponsor box, which I'll get to here in a second. And she has helped us with swag throughout the year. She also led us in a yoga exercise during our wellness day, which was quite a trip seeing me and probably some other Titans too doing yoga. But Anna's become a fast friend over the last few years. So thank you, Anna, for everything you do for us. Um, lastly, each year, I name check some Titans for everything that they do for this event. And this year will be no exception. I'm starting with two who've been name checked before, but we have two Titans who've earned their way into our Lifetime Achievement Award. And so I want special designation for them. And so hold your applause so I mention both names. Uh, J.E. Urseth, J.E., I want you to stand up if you can. Um, okay. Wendy, I said hold the applause, and then you're the one who broke that. <laughs> um, and then Jack Swift, who's back there. Jack. <laughs> That's all right, Wendy. I would expect nothing less th uh, than that out of you. So Jack and J.E. have been making this event happen for year after year after year now, and they deserve a ton of appreciation. We also have a few other Titans that are earning their way into that lifetime appreciation, but since this isn't soccer, I'm not giving everybody a, a trophy today. Um, but Becky Koberger, Jesse Stone, and Kenzie Holger also deserve a round of applause. So please give them a round of applause. <laughs> Last housekeeping. Oh, shoot, I was trying to make it through without saying housekeeping, sorry. Um, we describe this event as high energy and high content, which I've already mentioned. Um, so how do we create and inject some fun in this and how can you all contribute to that? Um, I want to name check a couple of partners who've inspired the format of the event. Um, good Leadership, uh, their Good Leadership Breakfast um, has helped shape the way that we want everyone to experience this event. And Team Women is who inspired us first for the live streaming a few years ago. So I think the event has taken on this this air of a combination of a good leadership breakfast, a team women event, Irish fair, and a KISS concert with e-commerce uh, content all mixed together. So that's the spirit that we want everybody to share in as we have fun today. Um, for those of you who were lucky enough to register earlier, uh, you received the sponsor box, which has a water bottle, um, we have a mouse pad, I won't go through all of it, but there are a number of goodies in here that we want to make sure people appreciate and have fun with. There are ice packs in here. Those are ours. 
I know there are some of us that will be using these tomorrow for injuries of some sort, I'm sure, <laughs> injuries or maladies of some sort, but these sponsor boxes are something that we take a lot of pride in encouraging our sponsors to include unique, useful gifts. So have some fun with that. We already talked about Jimmy Bagpipes. Thanks, Jimmy, for coming back year after year after year. Uh, we also added a new wrinkle before the event with Dave from the Big Fun Show doing some crowd magic and some crowd comedy. I didn't see it, but I talked to him ahead of time, so hopefully that was fun. And we have magician Matt joining us at the end of the event during the happy hour. He's been part of it before. If you can figure out what he does with that goldfish, you're smarter than any of us because nobody at Irish Titans has been able to figure that out. We also have live music from the Center of Irish Music at the end of the event at, during the happy hour. And we brought back Heather Willems from Two Line Studio, sitting right here. Hi, Heather. She's our visual storyteller. So she was part of the event last year when we had the whiteboarding that you could see via the live stream and or via the content that got shared after the event. So right there is an example of it, right? It was amazing what she did last year. I first saw her at a Coalition 9 event. I'm not sure if Aaron's here, but shout out to Coalition 9. That's been a great benefit to Irish Titan. Um, saw Heather in action, and so we added her to the event last year and had tremendously positive feedback. So we're excited to have her again, and you get to see her in person. And during our official break, our whiskey break, which you don't have to drink whiskey, but we're going to call it a whiskey break, um, you can see uh, Heather's work in Magic because it'll be both live streamed and on this, on this uh, screen. Lastly, we have Silly Putty and Play-Doh at all the tables for fidgeting and exercises. Keep it clean. Larry, I know you're here somewhere. Keep it clean. I'm going to single you out for that. But we added that to make sure that people had some, some outlet for that sort of activity. Because we do encourage movement and energy. If you want to get some food, get some drink, go do it. Right? This isn't a class where you have to remain seated. So do what you need to do to remain engaged. We're going to do what we can to make it engaging. Charity partner. We have long added uh, or included charity as part of this, and we've raised, I think, about $6,000 uh, since we started to do that, I think, three years ago, if I recall correctly. So Brand Lab is our continued ticket charity partner this year. They've been our charity partner the last few years. The ticket proceeds are going towards Brand Lab, which is looking to bring diversity into the marketing, uh, marketing industry. However, we've upped the ante this year with adding um, a ticket raffle for charity. So you can buy tickets from Mike Hoagland, who is around here somewhere. Look for the Titan, so he has a name tag that, with the green on it for Titan. He kind of looks like, not kind of, he very much resembles Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. <laughs> so look for Mike, that's who you can buy the tickets from. And then you can put your tickets into the charity or charities plural, if you want to split your vote, um, of your choice. And then we'll draw, um, or the charity, excuse me, the hat who has the most tickets, that's who gets the charity funds, okay? So we've added that this year. There's one other thing, and I don't need to look at my notes for this, that we've added. We've added marbles that are at the exit. And for those of you who are Titans or Titan alumni, because I know we have some Titan alumni in here, hi uh, Luke, um, and probably some others, uh, marbles has long been a tradition at Irish Titan, and it's been in our newsletters, so maybe some of you know about it. But every day, when a Titan leaves our office, because we are still in the office at least on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, every day when a Titan leaves the office, they grab a green, yellow, or red marble to throw into a bigger jar, and that marble is meant to be an indication of how good their day was. You can guess the green is good, yellow is okay, and the red is bad. That's meant to be a visual sort of barometer for us to get a sense of how things are going, and it's real. Um, on years that have been more of a challenge, we've had more red. On years that have been great, we've had more green. And it's a real thing because every year, at the end of the year, before our holiday party, I count the marbles. I used to count them by hand. Now I take them to the meat locker. I, may, I weigh out however many 100 weigh, and then I do the, mac, the backwards math to figure out the rest. And we go through what the year looks like based on those marbles. I'm shocked and disappointed in myself that I've never added them to this event before. So when you leave, grab a marble, that is indicative of how you feel about how this event went and how it made your day, all right? We wanna see a lot of green in there, but I also, I'm not from Minnesota, so I don't suffer from Minnesota nice. I want real marbles, so if you feel like this was a waste of your day, throw a red. We hope, 
We hope that's not the case, but throw a marble, please. Okay, we've added that this year and it actually means something to us. Last piece that I'll add before we start to kick off the, the rest of the content. A little bit of state of, the, state of the Union, if you will. So there's been a lot of angst in the last five to six months, right? In the economy in general and in the e-commerce industry. And there's not much we can do about the angst in the economy in general. Inflation, worldwide impacts, et cetera. As far as the industry though, I think that to some extent there are two reasons that led to some of that angst. One, there was too much easy institutional money chasing too few shopping carts. And I'm targeting that really at those of us in the, on the industry side and that's unfortunate for many of our friends in the industry who are at companies that struggled with that. But that money was chasing too few shopping carts because the demand that got pulled forward in 2020 and 2021, the e-commerce demand that got pulled forward, that wasn't sustainable, okay? Um, but I think what we have to remember is e-commerce is still growing. And I'm gonna mention two stats because I wanna get into the rest of the speakers. I'm not gonna talk at length about this, but there are two stats. One, Q1 2022, e-commerce sales were still up 125% compared to Q1 2020. So that goes to show you that um, the pace of growth might be slowing. But if you think back to 2020, before the first quarter, before all of that demand got pulled forward, we're still miles ahead of where that is, or where we were, I should say, okay? Secondly, Holiday e-commerce is expected to grow 13.5% this year. This year. Now, there's not a lot we can do about the industry, excuse me, the economy. But as far as the industry goes, we all have the power here and watching live to do everything we can to contribute to that. Right? I think those of us, whether we're merchant or industry, who have strong, healthy businesses with great teams of people, should be standing tall and be confident and count on that and make that happen. And that's one of the things that we wanna to try to motivate with this event and with the spirit that everybody leaves it with, okay? So with that, we're off. Buckle up, Buttercups. We'll see what's on the other side as we do this live stream in person. And we are going to get started with our first keynote. So um, as I mentioned, we like to lead with leadership and culture and people. That's what motivates me. I think that's one of the things about Irish Titan and our leadership team and our management team and all of our Titans is there's a certain spirit around how we all support each other, how we all make each other better. So we kick this event off with topics of that nature. Our speaker this year is um, someone that I have known for a long, long time. We've known each other since before either of us started our businesses. Um, so I've known her for over 20 years now, and she's a friend, she's someone that I get inspired by, she's a sounding board for me, she has inspired and helped many of our titans. So I'd like to introduce the um, CEO and leadership development consultant for Leadership Delta, a great friend of mine, Laura Boyd. Okay, welcome e-commerce forum friends. So exciting, I see some familiar faces, which is exciting for me. Uh, and I also decided this week, I'm like, crap, I gotta go get something green. And so I decided to get these pants and I thought, my husband's like, why did you get those? I'm like, well, I got three opportunities to wear them. Today, Christmas, and uh, shenanigans for good, right? Those are the, the three opportunities that I, that I have to wear them. So I'm a team player, this is, this is how we do it. Darren, thanks for the, uh, the nice introduction. And I have known him for a million years, a million years. Uh, it's, so it's been a really fun opportunity to be an entrepreneur alongside of him. But today we're gonna talk about imposter syndrome. And I wanna demystify it a little bit because I think that we, don't really understand what it is 
And we don't know how it's impacting our teams, ourselves, our kids, our generations that are coming up. And how do we overcome it? What are some things that we need to overcome? So that's what we're going to talk about today, because it is impacting our cultures. So the first thing is, I, you know, this is really embarrassing, but this is me. Uh, in 1979, I was nine years old, and uh, the reason I bring this up is because this is where it all began. So in 1980, at the end of the school year, we were at a year-end symposium, and our principal, Mr. Berger, uh, stands up there and he gives accolades for how the year went, and in elementary school they talk about the, you know, we're going to miss the sixth graders, and we're going to miss everybody over the summer, do your best. And then he also shares stories about the, the whole year that's gone on. And at the end, he starts talking about awards. And as part of that, they go through the, the presidential award. Does anybody remember the presidential award? I, seriously, doing those pull-ups? <laughs> Come on now. Who does that? Because uh, who does it, you know, when you say, well, why am I taking math? Because when am I going to use it again? But who does pull-ups and keeps doing those, too? I don't know. So Presidential Award talks about who is the best reader. How many books did you read? It talks about perfect attendance. Seriously, still disappointed I didn't get that. And I always talk about, I think that was miscalculated, for sure, because I should have had perfect attendance. And then at the end, after he does all of this, and you're sitting there, and these elementary kids are, were crisscross applesauce sitting on that hard floor with the smelliness of the lunch. Smelliness. So I'm giving you a picture of that, right? It's bringing you back. The smelliness of maybe some unbathed friends that are sitting around. And uh, he says, we're going to close out the symposium with these two awards. We have two final awards. And we do this every year. And he said, these two awards go to one person in fourth through sixth grade and one person in first through third grade. And this is our super citizenship award. And uh, when he talks about it, it's interesting because in elementary, do you even know what citizenship is? So I think it's funny that that is what they called the award. Uh, but what he, what he says is that the teachers voted on it. They vote on for leadership. They vote on things like reading and listening and, and all, you know, all the things that you want to be or aspire to when you're in elementary. And uh, so as we're sitting there, he says, the first through third grade, the award, the super citizenship, goes to Laura Boyd. And I was so excited. I can't even describe to you how excited I was because I'd never really won this big of an award. And it was huge. It was red, and it had this lady on it with these wings. It was awesome. I don't even know where it is today. Uh, but it was amazing, and I was so proud of myself. So I kind of skipped through the, the group and got up to the, the front, and he said, and I want to share with you a few things that your teachers said about you. And he said, she always was a great line leader. I mean, who doesn't want to be a line leader, right? <laughs> Uh, she always picked up the scraps. She helped a friend every day get his boots on. I laugh about that because I'm like, why couldn't he put his boot own boots on? I'm not sure. Uh, so that, those are the kinds of things that the teacher said about me. I was always willing to, to give a helping hand. And here's the interesting thing. When I looked at the crowd like this, I mean, much younger crowd, but at the end of the aisle was this woman standing there who happened to be my mom. And if you remember back in the 1980s, maybe some of you weren't born, so just stay with me, friends. Uh, but in the 1980s, there wasn't a lot of technology, or if, if any, uh, but there wasn't a lot of technology, which it didn't allow for people to have flexibility in their jobs. So when I knew my mom was there, it was a big deal. She took the day off. That was a big deal. And that's when I knew I had done something really cool. And so after the symposium, and we say goodbye to my mom, we're walking back to class, and I am on cloud nine. I'm beaming, because I've never had an award like this before. And my best friend leans over to me, and she says, you know why you got that award, don't you? I'm like, super citizen. <laughs> of course. And she leans over, and she said, no, it's because the teachers felt sorry for you. 
Okay, I love this because I get this response and then I'm like, okay, it makes me feel better. But no, we have to give her grace because she also is nine, you know, so we got to give her a little bit of grace too. Uh, so she's nine also. And it was interesting because from that day, moving forward, I never forgot it. I put it in my subconscious. And from that day, I was never going to let anybody feel sorry for me. I didn't want to earn anything because they felt sorry for me. I didn't want to earn anything because I was lucky. I didn't want to get anything because of external ideas or opportunities. But I didn't really realize it until I got older. So that's why I'm here to tell you I want to help you so that you can understand how can you conquer some of these feelings that you might have when you don't see yourself moving forward. And so the interesting thing, we talk about imposter syndrome, what is it? It could be anything. Imposter phenomenon, it could be fraud syndrome, it could be perceived fraudulence, it could be imposter experience. And that's how it all began was this imposter experience. What does that feel like? And so when they did a definition of it, they said, what is imposter syndrome? or imposter experience, and it's really about the persistent inability to accept your successes based on your own achievements. It's your inability to accept that. So what does that mean? I don't know, but here's my definition. This is a better one anyway. Uh, so I always say this is the Laura Boyd definition. Really what it is, is it is the difference between yourself and others. And so it might be how you might be feeling on the inside doesn't match the outside. And when you think about what the definition is, it's the space in between. And your whole goal, when you think about imposter syndrome and what it does to prevent you from moving forward on things, is to get that space a little bit tighter. You want it to be closer because what you're feeling on the inside is what you want to be feeling on the outside. So how you show up, what you're feeling on the inside, you want to be leading and showing up that way. So the good news for all of us or the bad news for all of us is that they say it happens to about 70 to 90 percent. And I say that means the rest of us are lying. Right, Because we've all been there maybe just once. Maybe some of us, it's a chronic thing for us. And it doesn't matter if you are a man or a woman. Now, back when they first did the research, they thought it was a female thing. And interestingly enough, it's in, it, they only talked to women. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's kind of interesting, right? If you're going to do research, that's the best way to do it, if you want to find something certain. But it does, it happens to men and women, it doesn't matter. It happens to young, older, middle, whatever it is. It is happening. And so when you talk about imposter syndrome, you talk about it that it it's also has this best friend named perfection. And this is something I've started to realize and have started to do more research on. These two are best friends and the worst enemies because they feed off of each other. Because a lot of times when you are living in imposter syndrome, that perfectionist friend is right there saying, okay, you better be perfect because you don't want to be found out you don't know what you're talking about. You better be perfect, right? So it goes back and forth. These two are friends and enemies and friends and enemies and it goes back and forth. And what ends up happening is it's impacting us every single day. Look around us. Perfection is on the rise. When you think of uh, societal perfection, it has doubled over the last 20 years. And when you think about how that's impacting our kids, I mean, I just think about from a sports standpoint. Kids today, they play one sport because we want them to be perfect at it, or they want to be perfect at it. Kids today also have about 100 and and 12 to 118 standardized tests from pre-K to 12th grade. We are expecting these kids to be perfect. And when you expect kids to be perfect, you're going to have some challenges. And you're going to have imposter syndrome right at their back door. 
where they're going to not go for things because they can't do it. They don't have the mentality of a growth mindset. I don't know how to do that yet. This is going to impact your industry. Technology industry is going to be impacted if we don't allow people to fail. And if we don't allow them to say, I don't know that yet. So let's talk a little bit about how this does impact us. Uh, because I think when you look at it from a personal standpoint, how does this impact you? Well, mental health is a huge issue today. We've been talking about it, you know, and it's, it's gone on before COVID, but I think it's being talked about more. Uh, anxiety, depression, they're seeing that there's specific ties back to imposter syndrome and perfectionism. Uh, overachieving, how many of you would say, I'm an overachiever? Yeah, nobody's gonna raise their hand today. <laughs> They're like, yeah, Laura, we're not doing that. So I always say I'm a recovering overachiever. I think my team would say, yeah, you're not recovering. <laughs> uh, it's actually, some of our societal perfection has caused a higher increase in eating disorders, uh, suicide ideation, and uh, not feeling that you're enough. Uh, procrastination. If you have so much going on because you want to do everything, you want to have this perfect life, you want to show that you are a perfect worker, you've got the perfect family, it's hard to not feel overwhelmed at that point. And so when you feel overwhelmed, you start to procrastinate. I just had my son, who was a junior at Eau Claire, he called me yesterday, he goes, um, I'm, having, I'm having a really bad day. I said, well, tell me about it. And I was having a really bad day too, but you know, as a parent, you're like, okay, fine. I guess I shouldn't talk about my problems. I'll listen to yours. Uh, so it was interesting. He, I could sense that when he was breathing, it was all up here. And I'm like, dude, you gotta breathe. And you gotta take things in stride. You gotta figure out what is a priority to get done today. So you gotta help these kids along the way. You don't have to do it all. He was trying to figure out how to get to Kohl's and get his oil change and get a, a new suit because he was going to something for AMA and it, there's just so much going on for these kids. And so how do we help them? Sleeplessness, discontentment. I love discontentment because this is what I struggle with. I'm constantly discontent with my own abilities, my own, my own uh, performance. And so one of my girlfriends actually gifted contentment for Christmas one year to me. Now, I give her a sweater, so I'm a little mad about that, but, you know, she just gave me a card, uh, and I love her, so it's good. And then just the, the sheer dissatisfaction. So if you have people on your team, if this is you, because you are struggling with perfection and imposter syndrome, if this is you, heed what we're going to talk about. Because the next thing is, this is how it's impacting our company. This is how it's impacting the culture of our organizations, and this is how it's impacting us as a society. And so when you have all of the mental health uh, challenges, these are things that are impacting our teams. The first thing is underachieving. If you have procrastination, I'm thinking of my son. He's just underachieving because he, he can't figure out how to stop. And so sometimes then you underachieve because then they won't see that you're perfect, so you don't have to be perfect the next time. That's happening. That's a cultural issue. Productivity, same thing with procrastination. Burnout. I'm hearing that, I see that all the time. When I coach executives, we're all talking about burnout. And I think a lot of it is because we're not putting up our own boundaries. And because we're scared to tell someone we have boundaries. And alongside of that is, is this quiet quitting. Uh, thanks, TikTok, for bringing something that we've had for years, but thanks for bringing it super popular now, calling it quiet quitting. But so it's so funny because some of my clients will say, well, what is this quiet quitting? I'm like, okay, well, it's disengaged employees and it's retiring in place. It's nothing new. So we've got to figure out how to work with it. Yes, thanks, TikTok. That's awesome. All right. So the other thing that it does is uh, it also has resource inefficiencies because if you have a team that is struggling with this or people on your team, they're starting to create this collusion. Like, I don't want to work with that person. 
instead of coming alongside him to say, hey, I've noticed that you're struggling today. What if you came alongside them and, and intentionally asked them how you can help them? Uh, also, decision making is longer, judging others, loss of excellent candidates. People can feel it when they get into your organization. Does it feel like a good organization? Does it feel like a place you want to work and have an exciting culture and do things that are outside the norm? Uh, the last thing is, it, it, it gives a sense of a lack of trust. And if you have a lack of trust in your organization, it's hard to move forward. So with all of those things, how do we break this cycle? How do we break the cycle? Because we have to. Well, here's one of the things. The first thing is you have to become aware of it. And I want to share another story that connects to the first story that I shared. And when about three or four years ago, I've had my business now for seven years, and three or four years ago, I realized that the outside looked awesome. I mean, if I do say so myself, but no, the outside of me looked great. People were like, oh, she's got a great family, everybody's healthy, her business is, is soaring, it's going really well. But the interesting thing, the inside wasn't matching the outside. And that was the challenge. I couldn't figure out why. I have so many great things and I was mad at myself, like what is your problem? So I ended up seeking help with a coach from California and she really helped me with this piece of it, is that you really need to become aware of something before you can change it, right? Because in our minds, and our minds are amazing, it gives us all of these stories that we tell over and over and over again. Because the one thing that I found out in my coaching was that the stories that my best friend had told me when I was nine years old stayed with me for almost 40 years until I was like, wait a second. That story stayed with me and it made me small. It made me not maybe move forward on things or invite myself to do something or invite myself to fail because I wasn't gonna let anything overpower me. I was gonna overachieve, overplease, overperfect. And I think that that's something that's really important in our brains is we've got to figure out what are the stories that we're telling ourselves. And so one of the things that I do for myself, it's weird and I'm gonna share it with you, is this orange hand. Whatever it is for you, but when you start to feel yourself spiral down, how can you stop? What's a way to stop? Some people go for a walk. Some people listen to music. Some people go exercise, whatever they do. But for me, I needed this orange hand because it stopped my brain from continuing on and on and on. And one of the, the ways that it helped me was to say, when I have these thoughts, do these thoughts help me or do they hinder me? So Byron Katie is, uh, she's a, a meditation specialist and she is awesome. And one of the things that she talks about is when she gets up in front of a crowd, she says, I go in and I believe all 200 of you are gonna love me. And I just think, well that's kind of you know conceited, isn't it? But she's like, why would I not wanna believe that? And she's right. Why would I wanna believe that all 200 of you are like, wow, Laura's gonna have this rock, she's gonna rock it, right? I don't wanna know if, if I'm not, I already believe that a little bit in me already. So she says, when you get into this mindset riff, ask these four questions. Is this true? And then secondly, can I be absolutely sure this is true? Because the first time you ask yourself that, you're like, yep, it's true. And then you're like, well, could it absolutely be true? And you're like, mm, well, I don't know, absolutely, right? And then how do I act when I believe this thought? How do I respond? How do I react to that? And then the last piece is, who am I without that thought? Who am I without that thought? So let's move into this. When we talk about stop faking it, I love, this is my favorite part. How many of you have heard this and used fake it till you make it? I just, it's so funny, I just spoke with uh, female, these high school female athletes on Monday night on the same topic. And so when I talked about this, they all got the fake it till you make it. And then I, I wanna ask this question. 
How many of you have actually faked it in business? Right? Probably most of us would say that. Now let me ask you this. How many of you have made it? A couple, okay, I had a couple high schoolers too. I was like, wow, you've got a long life. I mean, if you've made it in high school, it's gonna be kind of a boring life for you. So fake it till you make it is a tough thing because if you know of anybody that's made it, awesome. But most people I know would say, I haven't made it yet. Because what happens is I get to the top of the mountain, I say, where's the next highest mountain? And then I say, where's the next highest mountain? So if we're not making it, then what are we doing all day long? You can answer that. What are we doing all day long? We're faking it. And remember when we talked about what is imposter syndrome? It's the feeling that you are not in control of your own achievements. So essentially, you're faking it. So what I want you to do is I want you to believe to achieve. I want you to look inside of yourself and say, I believe in my abilities and my skill sets, and I am going to achieve this. Because that's closing that gap that I talked about. It's closing that gap. So the next thing is reframe your mindset. I can't tell you all leadership people think about this. How do you reframe your mindset? Because your brain is amazing. And all of those self-limiting beliefs that you have about yourself, they come back every day, by the way. Because you have about 60 thoughts in a day and about 59,000 were the same you had the, next, the day before. So until you use that orange hand, because now I'm expecting all of you to do that, but until you actually stop and reframe your mindset, oh, that's, that's a key part. You've got to make sure that you look at things. What story, thought, or meaning are you putting behind something that's causing you to have a feeling that's causing you to react a certain way? So my best friend telling me that they felt sorry for me subconsciously is in my brain. So when I get achievements, it brings me back to that day. Did I get it because they felt sorry for me? No. Not anymore, because I've conquered it. I believe in myself. I have reframed my mindset every day. Absolutely not, because you have to give yourself compassion. That's the step four. You have to give yourself compassion. Compassion is the start to change. If you don't have compassion for yourself and others, you are going to have a hard time changing. And so what I do to help myself is I say, I give grace to my thoughts. I give grace to my feelings. I give grace to my stories and meanings. And I choose compassion and love for myself. And it's not just about me, but it's about all of you. How can you give compassion to your team when they do fail? How can you be an intentional leader and show them some, some compassion so that they're OK failing and knowing that perfection is not OK? I don't know anybody that's perfect. I mean, I try to pretend I am. I tell my husband that. but So anyway, nobody's perfect. And then the last thing I want to share with you is find your people. Who are your people? And find your people who you know their heart to be true. They're not just going to say, hey, Laura, you are amazing. I don't care about that. I want somebody who is really going to say, wow, you, you could have done this a little differently. I thought you were amazing, but you could have done this differently. You know where their heart is. And Brene Brown talks about this too, right? Find, don't, don't talk to the people in the cheap seats, she says. Who cares about what they think? Find the people that are your people. And so I want to just end with, what if you felt worthy enough to do what you wanted to do or to help someone do what they wanted to do? What if we felt like we were enough just by ourselves? That's what I want you to think about today. How can you show up as a leader for yourself and for your team and for your organization and for e-commerce? I don't know enough about e-commerce, but I do know about cultures and leadership, and you need them both to be successful. Thank you so much. Have a super rest of your day. So before my good friend Laura leaves, wow. we are actually going to present her with her speaker gift. We've long been giving speaker gifts. 
Is there going to be a mouse that comes out of there? Well, you don't know. I might pull a rabbit out. <laughs> oh. Um, and we finally, a few years ago, got our act together to have the speaker gifts actually available on day of. Um, so here is your speaker gift, Laura. Oh, wow. And we want to zoom in on this a little bit um, so people can see it. You should hold it, though. Oh, yeah, I should hold it. Can everybody see this? Can everybody see this? I know it's small. It's an Ecom Forum speaker ring, um, kind of like a Super Bowl ring. <laughs> And it's pretty hefty, feel that. That's a real, that's not out of a gumball machine. Yeah, that's right. Well, I just started fantasy football, so maybe it'll be go. a fantasy speaker now. All right. All right, awesome, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. You can go that way. This way, yeah. And we do have speaker gifts for all the other speakers. You'll collect yours um, off to the side afterwards. So um, some great content there. I think depending on how we're all wired, we probably find different pieces of it relevant. I liked that um, uh, find your people. I think it was step five. I like people that will tell me I have things in my teeth, you know, because um, I'm often wrong but never in doubt, so I can, I can find value in people pointing that out. Um, quick note, um, we have some killjoys in the neighborhood who have called um, and reported cars parked on the street. So if anybody's parked on the street, please go move your car. I apologize for those killjoys. Okay, so we have a valet crew waiting, a valet crew of titans, I'm guessing, um, because we didn't have a valet crew here otherwise. Um, so um, if you'd like, give your keys to the titans and they'll move your cars and uh, we'll take care of that. So let's move on. Um, we are now gonna kick off our first spotlight. And I am excited for this because uh, he is both a good friend and I'm excited for the content because we're gonna learn how to make your e-commerce house a home, which is an analogy that, that I love. So let's welcome to the stage, uh, General Manager Ship Station, Robert Gilbreth. Thanks, hey, Robert. Uh, you sit here. Thanks, Darren. Uh, all right, the floor is yours. Where to, where to start after that? Um, I'm kind of doubting if I even deserve to be up here, but, uh, <laughs> but I appreciate the, I think I was uh, five years ago today, Darren and I were up on the stage at this event. So I'm Plus. super, super honored Beginning to, be, of a good friendship. to be asked back. Yeah, and we've become really good friends through the years, so much so that I normally don't need notes, but I'm so worried that we're gonna go off topic, um, which we <laughs> happen to do every once in a while that I have, I've had to have, have some notes today. Um, as Darren mentioned, we're gonna talk um, about uh, making your e-commerce site, your e-commerce house, your home. And I'm gonna share a few bits of data that um, the ShipStation team and the Octane team, our parent company, has gathered um, over the course of the last nine months or so. And um, I personally, uh, with my wife, we have, uh, we've lived in nine different houses in 18 years and um, have done remodeling and building and we started talking about topics here and it kind of hits close to home. So we're gonna go through and, and kind of equate what's happening in the market right now, what's happening as we get into busy season, um, back to um, different parts of building a home. Which is a great analogy. When I used to do the sales at Irish Titan, that was one of the analogies I used all the time in the conversations. So um, Robert, what are some of the, let, let's start with foundational I think, uh -huh. right? Um, so what are some of the shipping features or considerations that a merchant simply cannot afford to forget about or get wrong? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's like the table stakes of, you know, do you have a good pick, pack, and ship process? Is, uh, you know, is the warehouse set up in a way? Those are all just table stake kind of things. But from, our, from some of our research, um, this might not be a big surprise, but um, consumers still want free shipping. You know, they... Pre-COVID, they had these, you know, mostly Amazonian-driven expectations of free shipping. Um, but, and you would think, okay, COVID, there were uh, supply chain issues. The truth is, and most of you guys are retailers still, they didn't change the expectation. Um, what we found is we would see uh, consumers, they were still ordering like always, they would order from three places. And they would cancel the orders that, um, that didn't come through on time. Uh, the other piece that just got compounded with, with what, what we've been going through is on the return side. And say, pre-COVID, um, pre we would see a lot of folks that were, were at least charging a label fee for a return. Times have changed. The consumers are now expecting free returns. Thank you, Zappos, 
right? Thank you, those kind of folks. Thank you, um, buy online, return on store. And so, you know, we have to get creative with how we're doing returns, and so that it doesn't become a, you know, another cost suck for us as, as retailers. Um, so as we move into the, the structural uh, part of the conversation, why should a merchant opt for a shipping fulfillment platform sure. um, in lieu of handling things themselves? Yeah, so, um, you know, it, everyone today, we're all trying to be, or I keep saying we because I, I was a retailer most of my life before joining ShipStation, but um, you know, being multi-channel you know, selling at your store, selling on your website, selling at marketplaces, um, the, the old tech around that was not really built to be multi-channel. And so platforms like ShipStation are literally set up to wherever, wherever someone's selling, being able to adjust those orders in and being able to normalize that data in a way that allows you to, to operate through it and fulfill those orders out. That's one, one big piece of it. The other piece of it, I actually call this the Mickey Mouse Venn diagram. I don't have a picture for you, but if you can imagine Mickey Mouse's head, he's facing you guys. All the places you sell is this ear. Your, your, all your back office is his, his head, his brains. And the other ear are all the ways and places you might ship, picking up in store. Um, I would say a big piece of this, and some of you might be doing this already, is actually looking at your carrier mix and, and making sure that you're using the right carrier, the right service level, depending on what the, the piece of merchandise is. And thinking about um, maybe you want to change your product mix Right? Maybe you've been with Carrier X forever, but then you change your product mix, and guess what? Carrier X is actually not good for that thing. It's fragile, it's uh, larger, it's, it has some different quality. And so I'd encourage you to kind of look at that. And platforms like ShipStation allow you to be more flexible in who, who and how you, uh, who you work with. And I think some of what you talked about also touched on omnichannel, right? Yeah. Uh, because you talk about buying online, pick up in, picking up in store, or buying online, returning in store. Um, and so I think I would guess that with the uh, emergence of Omnichannel, which is going to be a topic that will come up in lots of conversations today, the, the value of a platform is even, is even higher now. 100, 100%. And platforms that are as, as many to many as possible and not just a couple to one or a couple to a couple. The other thing I was going to bring up about structural, if you guys have ever done any kind of remodeling or building and have dealt with your, your local city or, or your county, they always have, it seems every time I ever did something, there was always a few rules that like, I wish I could build something a certain way or make something look a certain way. And there was, I would always come up with these sort of roadblocks, these disconnects. And to another piece of our research um, that, that we've put together recently is um, you know, we, we talked to a lot of consumers through these two. Something we started doing uh, before, before COVID and through COVID is talking to the consumers and asking them what are they looking for out of their online experience and their retail experience. And then obviously all our own merchants and our partner merchants, we talked to those folks and they're telling us like what they're expected to do more or less of you know, in the coming years, right? And so I don't know if I'm saying I find it funny, but you know, businesses, were, merchants were worried about the cost of delivery well, the retailers, are the, 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 um, the shoppers are too, but in a different way, right? We're thinking about a cost center versus they're, they're not wanting to pay for shipping. And so um, I, we would be sharing these slides out after, Darren? Yep. Yeah, so yes. I, won't, I won't go through all these, but it's, it's funny as you glance at these, there's sort of a disconnect between what uh, merchants are saying they're going to do um, versus what the consumers. I think there's even one on here that talks about illuminating free returns, but that's what the consumers are asking about more and more. So think about, think about as we're getting a season, things that maybe programs you were thinking about starting or killing, um, and, and take, a, take a good look at those and think, think through it if it's something you really should, should be taking away from your consumer experience. Yeah, we will be sharing the deck along with uh, the visual storytelling whiteboard too. So. Uh, you broke this into three themes, which I love because that's how our brains work in threes, right? The first was foundational, second was structural, third is uh, finish, finish outs and furnishings. So what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I would say this, this uh, piece, um, it's, the, it's the, like say, different way, different payment methods or methodologies, uh, you know, offering as many different um, payment options as possible. You, know, you don't have to have that for your site to be successful, but it sure does, it sure can't help things, right? Um, doing a buy now, pay later, those kind of things. Thinking about using text or other means of communications with your, with your consumers. I'll even go old school on you. And we're seeing more retailers doing that traditionally didn't do like direct mail and out of home. 
getting into that space as, as online has gotten kind of messy, more messy and more expensive uh, through the, co the COVID rush. And so those are the kind of things that, these are the things you don't necessarily have to do, um, but I would encourage you to test them, try them out. Maybe some of them would stick. You know, maybe you like that convection uh, range versus the gas. It's, it's those kind of things. Um, and it's also, I don't know if we, we were gonna talk a little bit about, um, we call it, ShipStation would call it personalization. Um, you know, um, but it's, it's thinking about the whole experience from the, pre, the checkout piece and how you're talking to your customers about the shipping part, how much choice you're giving them, and how that, that sort of that whole delivery experience carries through to the product arriving at their, at their destination. I, don't, I shop on Amazon probably way too much. I think most of us do. Um, you know, I love now how they allow you to pick. They say it's your, your special day. It's really a way for them to consolidate all the orders and get it to you in one day. But you know, I'm out of town right now. I don't really want those packages sitting on my front porch. I get to pick a special day. So thinking about that and being able to offer your consumers a little bit of choice um, maybe you can't give them free shipping, but you can add some choice to it and kind of get over that a little bit of burn they might feel that they're actually paying, paying for, the, for, the, for that flow. Yeah, I think that part of what you touch on too, one of the things I think we connected on when we first met is that concept of e-commerce isn't about just the user experience when you get to the site and the design and the, and the sexy style, right? It's about the post-purchase experience too, that perfect order, if you yeah, will. No, well, that, so, yeah, that's a, that's a good point in that. That uh, the moment they've checked out, you've got that conversion, that's great, but there's so much more that, that they're still waiting for it to arrive, right? And how you communicate with them and, and get, get what they want in their hands is super important. Well, this has been great. Robert, I think this is an analogy we can all wrap our heads around. Why don't you share with people how to get a hold of you? Yeah, su super easy. Robert at ShipStation. Um, feel free to shoot me any questions. I'll be here all, all day as well and into the evening. So um, I, I love to geek out on on all, all things, even non-shipping. I'm a marketer before I was part of ShipStation, so i um, happy to chat, and uh, thanks, thanks for your time today. All right. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate that, that was great. You can take off that way, I'll take that. Um, so we'll be taking a really quick break here in a second, just as we bring the panel on, but before we do that, there are two titans that I wanna name check for special reasons kind of unrelated to this event. One is Tim Nickham. I'm not sure if Tim's on or not, but one of our Titans is getting married tomorrow. So congratulations in advance, Tim. And then we have a second Titan, Chris Ferber, whose birthday is today. He's tried to co-op this event saying it's his birthday party. Uh, but Chris, happy birthday. I know you're here somewhere. All right, so we're gonna drop for just a few seconds. There'll be a video as we get the panel ready, um, and we'll be right back in like 15, 30 seconds. Shopping used to happen like this. Now, businesses need to sell in person, online, and anywhere else people click, scroll, browse, or tap. And they can do it all on Big Commerce. Max, take this. Thank you, that's it. Hi, everybody. Hi. How are we doing? Great. Good. Good job so far. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> fast. Fan, yeah. I, I saw it in person. back today or something. <laughs> Good? All right. All right. Um, so we are back up and running um, with, I love the energy. I love the energy. So um, we are back up and running with our first panel. Um, we are going to be talking about building your e-commerce channel. So that could mean that you're building your first e-commerce site, could mean you're re-platforming, upgrading to a new platform, 
um, could mean that you're building a new channel. Perhaps you have a branded site and want to open Amazon, or you have a retail location and want to add an e-commerce channel. So it could mean any one of those. There is some overlap between building and growing, but the general theme we're going to be covering here is, is building. And we are fortunate enough to be joined by two powerhouse women from brands that everybody in this room should know. They'll introduce themselves real briefly. And um, a colleague of mine for a long time who's sat in a lot of chairs in the e-commerce space. So I'm excited for the conversation. Let's do quick introductions. Jill, let's start with you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jill Barley. I'm the director of, um, of uh, digital commerce at Every. <laughs> I'm Greta Brooks. I'm the director of digital marketing at the Minnesota Wild. And I can't wait to wear that ring with a Stanley Cup ring soon. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. It's heavy. All it's right. Heavy. Good. I like confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm Aaron Sheehan. I'm the director of competitive strategy at Big Commerce and uh, former competitor against against Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. Cooperator, we might say. That's right. Right. Yes. Um, okay. So let, let, let's start here. Um, we have some themes that we're going to work through. Uh, we won't bore you with the, what those themes are. The questions should sort of guide us. So we're going to start with Greta. Actually, um, Greta, we've been fortunate enough to work with you twice now, and you are a Three-time Ecom Forum speaker, is that right? Or is it two? It's three, right? <laughs> wow, you're in a very exclusive club. Uh, so at both organizations, you've recognized the need to, to for an enhanced e-commerce channel and then the need to sell that. So talk a little bit about your approach there, your experience, because we might, any one of us in any chair might know that we need a new e-commerce site, but we're often not the ones co controlling the purse strings. Sure. So. At both places, I think the key to selling in a build or a rebuild began with aligned results across all the stakeholders. And the key word that does the most in that sentence is aligned. Aligning all of your different departments in your company is super tough. It is high, high effort, high reward. So I would go to all of the different people that touch e-com, which is pretty much everybody. Sat with the warehouse, sat with the product people, creative people, brand, merchandisers, everybody. And I said, what are your pain points? What don't you like? What do you think about the web? What do you, what's your opinion? And would write it all down. And in the end, it helped not only create a roadmap for where I was gonna go and what I was gonna solve, but I brought that to the executives saying, here's, here's what we're gonna go do. And mostly when you solve a problem on the web, you're gonna have higher results, right? Return on investment and revenue. And boom, there's your exec buy-in right there. At the wild, I have a counterpart who helped me build a real financial model to prove that. Um, so that was nice. And then as a, another concrete example of, of how I would gain buy-in, <clears throat> my friends at Irish Titan helped me with this one at the wild. So we have a lot of social followers. And on Instagram, they're um, you know, highly inclined to purchase different types of merchandise. And we said, what if we can get a, a dollar out of all 500,000 of them in an, uh, the first year? And they said, sign us up. Pretty easy sell, yeah. actually, when you put it like that. Um, Jill, you bring a unique perspective today's, to today's event, given what you've been doing with EverEve, um, the enterprise level of what you've been doing, the omni-channel uh, approach that, that you have such passion around, and that brand for her um, that, that you guys talk about, which really resonates with me. I, li I like brand-intensive sorts of organizations, right? So in, in that experience, as you've grown ever use e-commerce channel through multiple milestones. What have been some of the pain points? What have been some of those, those experiences that would help you navigate that, that you reflect back on and or are applying today? Big question. Yeah, it's a big question. Um, and I've been with every since the very beginning. So, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of building, a lot of growing. And um, I can honestly say that the um, pain points that we're experiencing today are some of the same pain points that we had um, 10, 15 years ago, just at a different scale. Um, you know, one of the things that we really have to um, focus on is getting our product online as fast as possible. Um, we have 100 uh, brick and mortar stores nationwide, and um, if a customer, you know, walks into a store, um, turns around, and looks at her phone, she's got to be able to find that product online um, immediately. And um, to get a product online, you know, in a st or to get a product in a store is a lot easier process, right? They unpack a box, they put a label on it and they put it, they steam it, they put it on the sales floor. Well, online it's a bigger process, right? We've got photo shoots, we've got editing, um, we've got to you know, build um, great content, like um, you know, 
product descriptions, um, you know, just all sorts of product attribute information. Um, and it's a, it's a longer time frame. So we're, we're always kind of up against the clock there and trying to figure out how we can optimize and get that product online fast. Um, another area is that we, um, you know, we, we are constantly um, just taking care of our existing site, right? We have a very complex um, integration uh, tech stack. We've got to maintain that. Um, and we've got, um, you know, and we also have to prioritize making it better and building um, enhancements to that. And it's really hard to manage all of that um, and really to, and, and to keep focus on, you know, the things that are going to add value and, and, and drive growth. So um, we're really, we really struggle with just moving fast enough um, a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Aaron, you've heard from two big time brands, very different kinds of organizations, very different sorts of businesses. How does what you just heard from them square with what you hear in the industry with all the different sorts of conversations you're having and the different experiences you have? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I've heard both of those sentiments expressed many times uh, over the years in my current role. Um, I think the key is balance and, and speed at some level because there's a lot, especially the enterprise, there's a lot of different competing interests and stakeholders and people who have different specific needs they have from the business internally to you, plus your customers, right? Suppliers and everyone else. Um, and I think one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is composability is becoming more and more of a talking point as we work with, with merchants every day. They're, the old, the old I'd say, model, the model I grew up in in e-commerce was I, I sit across the table from a merchant, hey, I need this, 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 and this. I need personalization, I need inventory management, order management, SEO, and I want one throat to choke contractually. I want one mega platform that's going to sort of do everything for me, right? One RFP. Mm -hmm. um, the conversations we're having now, at, at Big Commerce anyway, are a lot more, I want to pull out pieces of it and replace pieces of that with a purpose-built, best-in-class offering that lets me go fast because I think merchants are realizing a little bit that like, you're going to end up managing a bunch of integrations. You might as well have a bunch of integrations with purpose-built platforms and solutions that let you go really fast. And I think the, 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 la the last note I would have on it is you know, the cart has become kind of a commodity a little bit. Um, there's an enormous amount of the e-commerce stack that's not the platform, it's the MarTech stuff. It's all the pixels, it's all the JavaScript you've got, it's the tracking and the personalization that goes into it. That's already happening. And so the conversations we're having now, I think, are a, a recognition of that fact where people are looking for, uh, they're buying into a composable model, I think, for, for their business. Yeah, I think that I've been in e-commerce for a long time, like a lot of us have, and I think some of the e-commerce 1.0, this paradigm I talk a lot about is e-commerce 1.0 solutions, 2.0 solutions, et cetera. And I think those 1.0 solutions were such a heavy lift that um, it was difficult to maintain and invest in marketing, et cetera. I think that both of you talk about scale and pace, which I think is really empowered by the e-commerce 2.0 solutions and the composability, headless, et cetera. So I think that's where the, the industry side has responded to merchant pain points, right? And you just heard Aaron talk about some of the emerging technologies. What is it, Jill, at EverEve that, um, what are some of those technologies that most excite you at Evere for what e-commerce might look like in the future as you yeah. build it? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm excited about a lot of things with e-commerce, um, and personalization is one of them. Um, you know, being able to have, like, a really clear uh, picture of who our customer is, where she's shopping, um, you know, and being able to offer a very uh, unique experience for her. If she, shop, if she goes into a store, looks at an item, you know, and she comes online, she sees that item, um, right away, I, I get really excited about that and being able to, to, you know, put that product in front of her in lots of different ways, lots of different channels, social media, you know, um, email, um, SMS, and, you know, just personalization, I think, is what I'm the most excited about right now. Yeah, I think personalization is one of those things that we've heard about for a long time and it's finally actually possible, yeah. right? So through a combination of many, many things. Um, so Greta, let's bounce over to you. So uh, you've navigated <laughs> mini tech stack uh, discovery sessions, requirements, platform selection, et cetera. Many with us and many with before 
we've ever met. So talk a little bit about your experience there, your approach there, lessons learned, so that everybody can benefit from that. Because that's a tricky road to navigate. In fact, one of our spotlight speakers last year was from the industry side who talked about how to, how to navigate it and shared some, some insights. So what, what do you have to share? Um, so yeah, that's one of my favorite parts of the job actually is, you know, everybody is trying to sell me something. Um, all the time. There's more bells, more whistles, more tiers I can climb in their services, right? But as e-commerce managers and directors, we are, you know, jacks of all trades, master of most of them, and it's, that's how they help me become that, right? I, I don't know what you offer until I listen. And so I like to sit in on whatever demos are offered to me and poke holes in it, and I say, poke holes back in it. What are, where are my blind spots in my business that I can't see? How can you help me with that? And that further you know, makes, shapes my decisions. When I talk to all my stakeholders internally too, I sound more informed because I am, um, and then I can budget accordingly, right, and create my roadmap that way. Erin, any insights that you would share um, about that, how right? to navigate <laughs> that sort of process, right? <laughs> yes. Like you have experience on the SI side, the tech partner side. Right, yeah, yeah, many, many hundreds of merchants, I think, going through this process. I, I, I feel like, uh, Naturally, I want to go through the list of like what not to do because uh, I mean you've seen so many like processes that didn't go well. Um, but I, I think takeaways: yes, on the demos. Get I'm a techie by nature, and so get my advice is to get as hands on with all of the solutions that you're being pitched as much as possible. Ask for a sandbox, ask for a demo, tr get every ounce of sort of like solutions and technical consulting that you can out of those vendors because only you can map your business and do the mental transformation in terms of like, what will life look like once I've adopted this wonderful bell or whistle, right, that I'm being sold. And, and I would be leery of vendors that don't want to let you in because there's a fair amount of, um, I would say, not quite ready for prime time solutions out there that are being sold. Um, and so get, you know, beat it up, beat it up hard. Um, make sure before you go to your board and ask for money that you know that it actually works. That would be a good, a good place to start, I think. I think another great place is to, is to also like ask for um, you know, a couple of month contract or like do a POC with these, with these vendors to see if it really works for you too. I mean, we didn't do that at the beginning and we started you know, asking and, and, and there's a lot, a lot of vendors will do that because they, they believe in their product. If they believe in it, right? They, they know you're gonna you know, have good findings and um, and yeah, ask, I would say ask for um, those POC, um, you know, contracts before signing the big, the that's big a, thing. That's good advice. I, and, and we're derailing you, sorry. I know there's, oh. uh, but the uh, MVPs, the value of a good MVP, yeah. the value of um, rolling out something that is limited in scope for a new vendor test is so huge because I think so many people want to migrate multiple multiple brands, multiple channels. They want to like, oh, we're going to redo how we do email. We're going to redo how we do whatever all at once across a large org. And like the more you can get buy-in for like that proof of concept, but make a functional proof of concept that actually like, hey, we're going to launch in a new market that we haven't launched before. The stakes aren't super high necessarily. And we've got more greenfield to do, to, to, to make a new solution. That is a great way to do it. Yeah, and I think too, you know, the, those vendors, they are confident in their product. And I think that the more, uh, more detail you put into what you need and what you're gonna get, the better. Like we're talking about some key requirements mapping exercises, right? Like how might a vendor's solution handle gift cards or handle buy, buy online, pick up in store, whatever it might be. If you can actually map that out rather than feeling forced into a quick decision, everybody will be in a better spot, right? In including the vendor. So uh, while we're talking technology, uh, Aaron, let's stick with you and talk about Headless a little bit because <laughs> okay. um, you know, technology is a big umbrella. Uh, there have been lots of things talked about uh, that never become actually living in the wild. Um, I think I remember when apps first came out and everybody wanted an app and if you had asked them why they couldn't, uh, they couldn't answer, I think Headless was sort of like that for a little while, but doesn't feel like that anymore. What are your thoughts on Headless? What is it? Who's it a good fit for? Who doesn't need it? How long that. do you have? I mean, they're in, so, uh, yeah, so, like, who, who in the audience knows the difference between headless and composable and feels very, like, sure that they know the difference? I'm just super curious. Like, yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Um, and, and I would say that, that a lot of us in the technology space don't necessarily help 
that, um, the way I describe it, I'll start, you've got a lot of questions there, right? So what is headless? So headless is, a headless is an adjective to describe a system. So if I have a headless e-commerce platform, it means that I have a back end that is decoupled from, my, from a front end, which is on a separate system, right? That's the whole point. That's why you would like have a separate back end from a separate front end. So it's an adjective to describe a system. Composable is uh, an adjective to describe a system, how you construct a stack. Many headless systems might build a composable stack. I might have a headless CMS. I might have a headless e-commerce platform. I might have a composable like promotions engine or loyalty program that fits with, within a larger stack. Um, and so I think understanding the difference between, you know, what's API first, what's mock, what's halo, like all these new terms keep sort of being generated out of LinkedIn continuously. Right. Um, as far as who is it a fit for, that's a tricky question. Um, my advice for a long time, and, and, and I think I'm sticking with it for the moment, is that a headless or composable stack is a good answer for a merchant that is mature, meaning has a CTO and an IT staff, um, and that sells across multiple channels. Because the value of a headless set of solutions, it, there's several potential values, but the real one is that you're able to author content, host images, you, and post them out to multiple channels. So if you have a mobile app, maybe you've got three or four different storefronts, You've got other systems, maybe you've got kiosks, maybe you've got a store point of sale. Like the more that you can get the benefits of having a composable system is where you have a lot of surface area upon which to sell and you want one place to sort of like manage that uh, as opposed to having, okay, when I want to like manage my kiosks, I have to go, in, I have to go like unlock a cabinet and like go like pro put stuff in the kiosk. Like you want to push that in via remote system. Yeah, I, th I think something that we heard a lot, and I think you guys have probably heard this at the conferences you attend, is the concept of not e-commerce, but commerce, right? Like we've, we've heard that for a while. And I think that's becoming uh, a, a reality because you don't go to just a branded site anymore, or you're not forced to go to just a branded site to purchase, and you're not even going just to marketplaces like Amazon anymore. Could be kiosk, could be social. You know, there's a convergence of video and social happening now. I think that 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 the emergence of that distributed commerce is what's I think enabling, empowering, and driving headless, composable, et cetera, all of it. Right? Let's shift gears a little bit um, because we talked technology. Let's talk maybe experience now because both Ever Eve and the Minnesota Wild are incredibly strong brands. I know that both of you care about not just the, the shopping experience, but the post checkout experience um, and how people process and technology all boil up into that. So let's do a bit of a, we're moving into a shamrock round instead of lightning round, uh, shamrock round. My team always laughs and rolls their eyes at all the Irish analogies I make too. So it's okay if you want to. Um, but let's start with just the two of you. Um, how, how do you how, how do you prioritize that? How do you bring that to life on the site, post purchase, everything? I think that we'll start with Greta on this one. Wonderful. Um, so let's see. The the Minnesota Wild has has a great brand footprint. Um, we don't struggle there, right? And our product sometimes on the ice doesn't perform how our fans may want. Like if we lose, it's okay. That's where we we're really lucky you're still gonna buy our merch because you love the team, right? And when you go to the retail shop um, in the Excel Energy Center in St. Paul, we want it to be as easy as possible and online. And right now, I, well, like before I started there, I thought, they must have that all figured out, it's gotta be great. It's super disconnected. Everything you see that a player might wear is not available online. And then we have all these bots on social media, you know, getting all of our t-shirt money. Um, so one thing that we're trying to do is make it a little bit more cohesive. So if you are in, in the in-game experience, which you know we've got down pat, you might see a, a t-shirt on the captain, right? And there's a QR code on the Jumbotron and you can scan that and purchase it so it's either waiting for you on the way out or it's delivered to your home. And there's a lot of logistics there. Um, so that's one of our goals coming up. Um, am I missing something? I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Okay. Jill. Um, I think, it, like, like you had said, we have a really strong um, in-store customer experience that we have um, really, we have to be really thoughtful about being consistent with online. Um, you know, like I said, we have to get our product online um, and, and have the same product available, but we also have to, um, we, don't have, we don't have stylists like talking for us online, so we have to really make um, that product look beautiful, right? We spend 
um, a lot of time uh, styling our photographs, and I think we do, do it better than anybody else out there. Um, and we add really rich content um, and data about the, the, you know, the fit of the garment, like the, um, you know, how you want to wear it, how you can wear it, how you can, what you pair it with. Um, and um, that, that information, that content is so critical. Um, we do a lot of UGC, user-generated content, um, so customers can see like how to style their, their outfit um, in many different ways. Um, and um, we're, we're actually investing heavily in video, too. Um, and um, you know, we have hosts, we have several hosts that uh, weekly put out these, this video that you can see across all our platforms. You can see it on social media, you can see them in big um, you know, screens in our stores. Um, and online too, in a space called Every or Every TV, and um, we've made it really easy for you to binge watch your favorite hosts. Um, they're talking about new trends, you know, um, new product always, um, their favorite things, how to wear it, and um, yeah, you can binge it online. You can shop the product really easily, and um, we're really excited about um, just integrating that even more into the purchase. Um, journey for the customer, and we're really leading the marketplace in that way. There's, there's, there's not a lot of retailers out there doing that, so um, it's exciting. When we first started uh, talking a few years ago, I was so impressed with that passion you have around your brand, how you refer to it, um, and the care you put into how that is represented, right? So let's, let's dig on that uh, a little bit deeper because um, I, I wanna cover a little bit of some of the marketing strategies and, and how you're investing in some of the more advanced strategies there. Uh, and I'll, I'll throw you a big softball, you can pick which direction you go, but whether it's email marketing or SMS, or you mentioned video um, personalization, what are some of those more advanced approaches that you're either executing now or on that near horizon? Yeah, so we, we learned real easy or real early that email marketing was a really good channel for us. We do a lot of it, um, and the customer really responds to that. So um, we, do a, we do a ton of that. Um, we do, like I said, we do a ton of video. We're going to continue to invest more there. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel like we're, we're kind of, we're, we, we do a really good job of hitting every channel, every, you know, whether it's social media um, and um, in our stores, we're always talking about the same product so she can get online and get that product um, really fast and easy. And you just heard her, so she can get online. I love how you refer <laughs> to your client. But in, for example, A-B testing, you do a lot of A-B testing. We do testing. a lot of A-B testing, right? yep. Yep, that's why I was talking about how it's so important to just test the, you know, the products before, before you buy them um, because we, we put, you know, we, we put, uh, you know, a recommendation tool up against our, our in, you know, our, 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 you know, own built, you know, tool, and, and we learned that it wasn't really any better. Um, so um, do as much A-B testing as you can, really, because there's such good learnings there. And look for a lot of advanced video uh, approach coming from Ever Eve in the future. I know that you have some real strong ideas there that will be fun. Greta, uh, let's bounce over to you, because I think that something that's unique to your experience is that the omni-channel approach, uh, which we've talked about a few times already over the course of the event, but for you, omni-channel doesn't mean, for the Minnesota Wild, it doesn't mean just the website and the hockey lodge, for example. You also are navigating the relationship with Fanatics, for example, which is one of the official channels for the NHL, right? right. So talk a little bit about how you're navigating that and trying to capture your own e-commerce success, you know, navigating what Fanatics is trying to control, et cetera. Yeah, it's like a it's like a direct competitor for our, our merchandise site, which is HockeyLodge.com. Um, so, but you all know you can get wild gear at Fanatics and Target, right? You all know it exists there. You probably didn't. You might not have known there was a HockeyLodge.com, the official Minnesota Wild merchandiser with the best and most authentic gear, right? Well, what, what was the URL? <laughs> URL again? Yeah. Don't go yet. The new site's not launched. But um, <clears throat> so that's those are our competitors. Our unique thing to our website is it's run by the NHL, um, the bones of it, and we fill it with content. And the shop, the shop link in the navigation goes to Fanatics. That's a huge hurdle for us. So one of the ways we differentiate ourselves is through video. Um, we are the ones with access to the players. We get the access on the ice. They don't have that. So we're going to sell through video. We don't have anything fancy yet where you can click and see it, right? That would be a great future. 
but we can push it through our social channels, and it's the you know emotion that you've been to a game and you remember it, or you love that guy and you want what he has on. So that's what we're going to try and capital, capitalize on to differentiate ourselves, and hopefully have an easy, seamless shopping experience to match. Because they're, I mean, Target, yeah, you can walk in and get it. That's fine. Um, it's cheap and whatever. And Fanatics is difficult to shop, so we, our aim is to be better than them. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. I navigate that, especially <laughs> as we create a more powerful e-commerce channel. That's right. Right. <laughs> um, so now we're officially moving into the Shamrock round. Uh, let's start with project success. And Aaron, I'd encourage you to, to answer first just to start the conversation. But what advice would you have around how merchants can best ensure project success? Because that's difficult in any industry, let alone, I think, a technology-driven like a technology-driven industry like e-commerce. So thoughts on how to best achieve success, manage yeah. scope, et cetera. Many, many thoughts. I think the I think all the cautions about demoing, right, and interviewing all your stakeholders and making sure you have a full understanding of your entire business before you go into the requirements process. But in terms of in terms of the project success itself, I can't I can't really oversell I think the value of um, business analysis or business analyst or business systems analyst or solutions architect or somebody in your organization as a merchant because the agencies we all we all bring you know we'll bring those people right but like somebody who sits in your office in your building who can translate between the needs of the business the needs of the customer and the sort of the dev speak the the technical implications of those requirements that's a role that I, I found is often kind of ad hoc filled or sort of share a shared responsibility between multiple people or um, just not there at all. It's, it's more of a, hey, we bought, the, we, 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 we bought it and in six months, you're gonna, there's a cake that's gonna come out of the oven and it's gonna be the best cake ever. And it, it does, software doesn't work that way particularly well because there's always change. And so it's, it's somebody who can mediate between the business and the developers, whether those are in-house or, or an agency like Irish Titan, an excellent, an excellent agency, most excellent. Um, Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, you're welcome, free, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that was not required. Later. Yeah, um, but I think that's super valuable because, because there's, and the reason that it's valuable is especially because over the course of a project, requirements are gonna change. So the thing you thought you knew in January, when it actually gets built in June, it's different. And somebody's gonna have to go back and understand that like an API over here changed or a vendor made a policy change or something happened in the warehouse and that's gonna funnel up to the checkout process. Like that's gotta be somebody's, you know, that's gonna be somebody's baby to sort of like help that. And a lot of times it falls to the e-commerce directors to sort of do that. And there's a million stuff like, million things like that, right? I mean, that sort of like come up over the life of the life of the project. And I think that's a role that, that I think merchants should just own. Project success comments from the merchant side of the panel? That's true, but also I, I like to start a project with a mantra that we stick to. So, you know, it could be like no customizations, right? And you say it over and over and over in every single meeting. There are no customizations to this project. So whatever you just said, phase two, if it's not you know, needed. Things like that happens. So you have to be prepared and agile. Um, or like for ours, we are hoping to launch soon for this big event for this special jersey coming out. Do we need whatever bell and whistle you're talking about to do that one thing? Nope, then we're doing it in January. And everybody handshakes at the beginning, and I'd love to remind people about that. <laughs> Good luck. You know, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Any thoughts on project success, Jill? Yeah, I mean, I think that the most important thing is to really keep your customer in mind and um, just be your own best customer, really, because it, you, you know, it, it's really easy to get caught up in those things, but you have to stay focused on what the user um, is expecting when they come to the site. And they might not be expecting you know, all these bells and whistles, they just you know, want something else. And it, you can lose sight of that really easily um, with all the things on our plate. And I think um, you know, it's our job to really stay focused on the user um, and that experience. And so we've talked about uh, the technology side of things, we've talked about a lot about brand, uh, talked about project, right? Um, what about people though? One of the things I learned early in my career is this concept of people, process, and technology, right? Um, and so when you're building or rebuilding your platform, how do, you, uh, how do you navigate forming the right team, whether it's a project team and or how does that relate to the team that runs the e-commerce channel, right? Like how do you navigate the people side of your e-commerce channel? Do you want to go first, Jill? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really 
really hard. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of pieces, and um, you know, we've been we've been really lucky to have a really great team and um, with a lot of really um, great in-house um, talent. And yeah, I don't. I, that's a tough one for me. <laughs> is your is your e-commerce team when you when you undergo projects? Is that team the same team that's running the e-commerce channel? For the most part. Mm -hmm. Okay. All yeah. right. People comments? Bribery. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's always a good one. I, I, but I, I think I mean incentive, making sure incentive structures are aligned. I mean, the, the team that's doing the project is also the team that's operating the channel. You've got a full-time job already, and now you're sort of like, here's this other full-time job that you're going to have for six months, like, like doing a big sort of like systems migration. And I think making sure that there's space for people, because every, everybody's wearing two hats at least, making sure that there's space and... Um, grace, I think, to use a term from, from our keynote speaker, um, for people to stretch outside of their normal, their normal space, right, and do something that maybe they haven't been asked to do. There's a difference between sort of project management um, of a large sort of tech project and sort of like the, the it's, it's the stand versus the run, right? Standing something up is different than running it, right, from a, from a mindset standpoint. And so making sure that people's job titles, their support networks, the systems they have to work with can flex to both models as needed. Absolutely, yeah. Greta, you're pretty yeah, gifted I, with people. You I, have those I agree with all of that. I like to find a champion in each of my departments that I'm servicing with, this, with my new e-com builds. Um, they might not be on the SWAT team, right? But if I can get them on there, I will. And I focus on that person that I know will be my internal PR, right? They're gonna be the one that's like, this is why they're doing this, it's painful now, but this is why it's gonna get better for us. This is the problem they're fixing. And that's worked well for me. Um, and I also think to help instill in the team, <clears throat> like we might not all have our jobs we have today forever. And one of the things that I did at my last job was you know learn all these things. It is two jobs at once. It has helped me now have my dream job, and so I think that's important for people to know too that it's going to take you places. Learning how the web works is valuable. The champion in each discipline is a great suggestion too. Great piece of advice. So let's start to close out here. Um, let's uh, wrap up with one piece of advice that you would share with a merchant or industry partner um, that you want them to walk away with. So Jill, you want to kick us off? Yeah, I mean I feel like I. Kind of touched on everything, like testing, really the importance of testing, um, and just uh, try before you buy. Uh, mine is that whoever it's, is the lead project lead or the sponsor for your project, if it's you or somebody on your team, make sure that person has incredible tenacity because these are long, hard projects. They need the right temperament, right, for it. And then my last one is if you can find the money, hire a project manager. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yes. You Great find point. the money somewhere, yeah. I saw yeah. a project manager throw their hands up back there. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Aaron. Uh, I agree with that one 100%. 100%. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Being on the agency side of the house, you know, I think I go back to, and I think I, I, I get the tension between stay laser focused on scope and not scope, but I, I'm going to say flexibility at some level because... The, the stuff is going to change on you, right? The economy, COVID's going to happen, or right, the economy is going to like have issues, or uh, another piece of technology on the project that's totally unrelated to what you're doing is going to like crap itself, and you're going to be, you're going to have to react to that. And so I think being able to pivot between keeping the vision of the project firmly in mind. Um, which is absolutely necessary, but also understanding that like you're gonna have to roll with the punches a little bit because stuff is gonna happen along the way. So make sure that you have a team buy-in and budget <laughs> for like never end. You know, always leave some wiggle room there when you're doing the capex thing um, to deal with unexpected challenges. Right. Well. Thank you for enlightening all of us. Uh, I think there was a lot of great content in there from some great brands, some, some great uh, brains. So thank you for helping us learn how to build our e-commerce channels. Um, you can exit stage left, if I have the terminology right, and pick up your speaker rings over there. Uh, at the, I think they're at the, the technology table. So thank you. Let's give a round of applause. Uh, quick reminder, uh, hopefully that conversation inspired you with some thoughts about how you might build your uh, e-commerce channel. Um, 
Uh, and so on the live stream too. So remember, write down some of your ideas so you can submit them and win a free kilt because who doesn't want a kilt or a second one if you already have one. So we're gonna take a super quick break like that last one. We'll have a longer break after this next spotlight, but we're gonna move some tables or some chairs around. We'll be right back in a matter of seconds. Be right back. Agency Partner Manager from Shopify. Making commerce better for everyone is in the DNA of Shopify which is why I'm super excited to be attending Ecom Forum 2022. What excites me the most is an opportunity to meet you amazing folks who are doing interesting and cutting edge things to make lives and wallets of merchants better. See you in the Twin Cities. Take care. We are back, ready to continue on with our e-commerce content here. Uh, we are gonna move into our second spotlight. Uh, one of the things we've added this year is this fireside spotlight concept where it's a little bit of a dialogue and actually we have some fire going on outside, which I didn't even realize. Uh, but we're gonna call these fireside spotlights and they'll probably be part of it going forward. So um, also a quick reminder, Make sure to engage with that, the big green table right around the corner. If you want li a live small group dialogue with some Titans and an omni-channel expert about how you might build and grow your e-commerce channel. But we are now gonna move into a conversation with our next spotlight speaker who's going to talk a little bit about omni-channel, which has moved from industry talk to every town main street. Uh, Matt, uh, Matt Hickey from Shopify. Thanks for joining us, Matt. So, Matt, um, can you give us a quick recap on single, multi, and omni-channel selling strategies? Maybe start even with a quick level set on what those definitions might be, single, multi, and omni. Yeah, for sure. So, um, obviously, we've heard a lot of talk about omni-channel already, but uh, we've got a few different sales channels. So, single channel, pretty evident of what that should be. You've got one avenue where you're selling, maybe an online store, retail, something like that. Um, multi-channel expands on that a little bit more. You're kind of selling within a few different spots, maybe retail channel, your online site, Amazon store, social media selling, something like that. Um, and then there's omni-channel commerce, which very similar to multi-channel, uh, but it's more of an all-engrossing, all-encompassing uh, strategy that really focuses on the customer as opposed to the product. So what are some of the strategies within each of those? Yeah, so your single channel commerce most likely going to be like a, a smaller business uh, or someone who's getting started just with like a classic online store, what we're typical representation here. Um, the multi-channel is going to be a little bit bigger of an of a, of a enterprise, uh, most likely something like a manufacturer, like we'll just say like an iPhone wire or something like that, where they're distributing their product across different channels. They don't really care where they're selling. They just want to get those products sold. They want to increase that revenue, um, but they don't really want to take on the whole omni-channel experience, which is really tailored towards the customer first. Um, you're really bringing in all those different sales channels to one harmonious area in the omni-channel um, 
strategy. It's the customer first. It's servicing them, whether they're on your Amazon store, your online store, your, in your retail store, wherever they are, you have access to their customer data, their likes, what they've bought before, you know, their tendencies, and you're able to really provide uh, a mom and pop style like um, shopping experience to them, except mom and pop are now like TikTok influencers and they drive segways everywhere. So is some of that um, mindset, right, more than the actual pre uh, procedures and technology, is some of it more of a mindset? For sure, yeah. It's really, the Omni channel is really for the brand. For a brand who's really focused on themselves, they want to make sure that their customers keep coming back, returning over and over again, that's the Omni channel experience. That's what they're really, they're really driving for. Um, so, that diagram and, and this next point too, the, the, uh, a lot of people talk about retail is dying, which we've heard forever um, when we go to e-commerce conferences and it's never been true. Uh, so why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So retail is not dying. <laughs> it's just evolving and changing. Um, very much like when like online store came in through retail, like there's just changes that are happening right now. Um, we're seeing more of a shift back towards retail almost in a sense. It's like. Early 2000s, if you had a store and you had a website, it's like, oh my God, you're cutting experience. Now, if you have a website and you have a store, oh my God, you're like, what happened here? Like, you guys actually got a store too? It's crazy. So, um, retail is a really big thing. And one thing that's really great is just the ability to approach it in different ways. People think like retail, I've got to sign a 12-year lease with a, with a brick and mortar store and we've got to set it up there. There's pop-up shops, there's kiosks, there's different ways that we've heard from other panelists talked about before. You can, you can bridge that gap into retail without necessarily those long-term commitments that traditionally held, uh, held retailers back. So what are some of the best strategies for someone that's looking to move to a multi-channel or omni-channel environment? For sure. Um, Definitely you want to do it properly. Um, people like, just take on TikTok because they think TikTok and they have like one follower or something like that. Like you need to do it when it makes sense for you, your, your brand, your company, whatever the case may be. Um, Multi-channel multi -channel is a great way for merchants to sell their stuff across different avenues. Omni-channel is a great way to increase your brand awareness, but there are a lot of obviously technical um, implementations that are required to get that harmonious system set up and um, that, that experience you want to give to your customers. And I think that one of the things that's enabling this, like a lot of the topics we've talked about today, is just the, the technology is so much more powerful and enabling and empowering than it used to be. You know, I think that sometimes in the past, and by past I mean a distant time ago now, but you would spend all your budget getting an e-commerce site launched and you couldn't really integrate it very well with an in-store POS, for example. Exactly. And now that is not nearly the burden that it used to be. Um, Shopify is one of the people who have empowered that, right? Like Shopify POS, Shopify um, e-commerce. And there are other solutions too that I think do, uh, if you're starting from scratch, I think that that seems really apparent. If you're a little bit more of a legacy or have been around for a little while with older systems, I think that there are technologies that you may not have truly investigated that do allow for that now, right? Yeah, um, obviously I'll talk to Shopify. Um, certainly an omni-channel is something that we have been really, really pushing towards with our POS retail systems, online store obviously, B2B, uh, we integrate social channels, sales channels with Amazon, TikTok, all of those. So, Something like Shopify, um, you know, other SaaS platforms where you can have that integrated harmonious experience within the e-commerce system, it's going to make things a lot easier for you. It's going to reduce your tech stack. And then obviously as you're ready to grow and expand, you can look into different solutions. Anything you'd like to wrap up with? Anything you'd like to leave the audience with? Um, you have a wonderful mall here. It was great to see that. A um, <laughs> lot of omni-channel selling there. It's really great to see like the merchants that are like that have online stores that have like retail locations in there as well. You can tell where well. Uh, you can see the uh, the impact from your the staff that are there. The one great thing about omni-channel um, is just like the overall um, ecosystem that your company will create. Um, you know. You won't have that friction where an online gift card can't be used in store and an in-store gift card can't be used online and people don't want to do a sale for the online store because they want to get their profit on the retail side. So omni-channel is a really great way for you to just create that brand that customers are going to want to keep returning over and over and over again and just keep engaging with you um, for as long as you're in business. Great. Thanks for being part of the event, Matt. Appreciate it. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. Now, this is page left. Appreciate it. I'll take the clicker.
All right, uh, so before we move into our next segment, um, I actually want to reverse course on a previous comment. Larry Toma, come up here, please. Yep. So, um, Larry and Irish Titan go way back. He's who I singled out a little bit earlier for be a little cautious what his Play-Doh um, output might be, but Larry is the longest tenured Ecom Forum attendee. I think you've been to everyone, is that right? All right, so let's give a round of applause for that. In case you need it. Um, and I am bequeathing upon you a green Irish Titan dog tag. So some of you may have seen these at our events in the past, but we just got green ones. I don't know why they were black before. I don't know why I didn't have green ones. Um, I'm wearing a green one. You are now the second person to have a green Irish Titan dog tag. I'll be opening beer all day. All right. Thanks, man. He's also begged for recognition every year. So, um, all right, so we are gonna move into our official whiskey break now, so this will be a bit longer. Um, I think it's gonna be how many minutes? Five minutes? Uh, so, take a break, uh, refuel with high octane, low octane, no octane if you want. You can also witness Heather Willems and her visual storytelling, which will be displayed up there. And on the live stream, we'll be right back. Thanks, everybody.
Are we on the live? Yeah, we're on. I hear myself. Um, it's the only way you get the right answer. So my dad always said, growing up on the farm, he'd talk to himself, and when I'd say something to him, he'd say, well, it's the only way I get the right answers is if I talk to myself. So let's try to corral everybody back. I know everybody's having fun with the food and drink, which is exactly what we want. That creates the energy that we're looking for. But we want to get moving into our, our panel here shortly so we can stay on schedule. Um, real quickly, I want to tap dance for just a second with a couple of thank yous. So first of all, let's give a round of applause and a thank you to the staff here at Hutton House, okay? Uh, this is our first time hosting the event here and we've had nothing but a great experience. Feels really good here today. We've, we're getting a lot of positive feedback from everybody who's here. So thanks to the staff for taking good care of us. Um, and then secondly, I want to add a big thank you to MCN6. So they are who we've worked with the last two years on the live streaming um, and where we hosted it at their facility. In typical Irish Titan fashion, we challenge them this year because we always are doing something different and trying to make it better. In fact, I wanted to host it at our office and I tried to push that through and that just wasn't gonna work. But MCN6 moved their equipment out here and is taking great care of us again. So I really would appreciate a strong round of applause for them because they've been fantastic. All right, so we're gonna to start to move into our grow panel now. We talked earlier about building, referring to building your e-commerce site or maybe replatforming. This panel, we're gonna focus a little bit more on how you grow your e-commerce channel. That could be expanding uh, to different channels, could be taking your existing site and applying some acquisition, conversion, retention, marketing strategies. Um, and so this grow panel, We'll have some overlap probably in some theme, but we're gonna focus on, on, on the growing side of things. So let's hear about that from two very different merchants. And we'll do introductions here in a second. Plus one experienced, articulate, insightful industry expert who's also a friend. Um, and I also think actually we should give a round of applause to Eric who I'll introduce here in a second because I know what he did last night um, and his priorities were right. He took his son to a concert in Chicago, Iron Maiden, we're both metalheads, right? Wearing the socks to prove it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and got up early this morning at like four o'clock to make it here for the event. So round of applause for Eric for that. <laughs> what you do for metal. That's right, your right. priorities are straight because he's right. gonna remember that. That's so right. anyway, let's do introductions real quick, left to right. Eric, you wanna go first? Hey, Eric Feuerstein, Director of Alliances at Attentive. Yes, I was at the Iron Maiden concert last night. Yes, it was great. Yes, I've made it here somehow. Uh, I'm looking forward to chatting with everyone today. Robert. Yeah. Uh, Robert Beeman, marketing manager for hardware distributors and woodworkers hardware. Um, I only live up in St. Cloud, so I only had an hour drive. My night wasn't as exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Jason. Uh, Jason Hammerberg, uh, Hammermade uh, founder and CEO. Uh, happy to be here. And I am a Hammermade fan even before we ever met in some of our videos. So I don't always wear video worthy clothes to, to the office. So I keep a hammer made shirt and a blazer at my office. And so you've seen some of Jason's work <laughs> on some of our videos. Um, and we're not gonna talk Iron Maiden metal the whole time, but I did try to do walkout tracks uh, and I had Iron Maiden picked for this panel. Nice. And I got overruled because of this thing called ASCAP, which I oh. don't really even agree with. But anyway, let's get started uh, talking about growing e-commerce channels, right? Eric, you have been in the space for a long time in a lot of different roles. Um, so is there a mindset that you've seen demonstrated by the merchants who've best performed in growing those e-commerce channels? Yeah, it's a tough question because we've worked with so many really successful merchants over the years in a number of different tech companies. You know, I think the one thing I see certainly over the last year or two that a lot of the really successful brands have in common um, are that they put like they put the customer at the absolute center of the decision making process as to how is the brand um, going to fit like into the feed of that customer's life. Like, you know, what channels does the customer want the brand to interact with them through? Um, where do they want, you know, the, the brand to meet them? Is it, is it social? Is it, you know, SMS for like a really personal, ex personalized experience? Is it email? You know, someone earlier mentioned direct mail. Like, 
you know, whatever, whatever that channel is, like putting that, putting that power back into the hand of the customer. Because at the end of the day, if you're communicating with them through the channel that they're telling you that they want you to communicate with them through, it's just going to be, you know, a far greater level of success. I think that must be um, one of the most uh, tried and true philosophies to maintain, right? Jill from Every mentioned earlier, keeping the customer at the center of what you're doing, and then you're talking about it. So there's clearly some merit to that. Yeah, I mean, it's that or like the the spray and pray mentality that we've all used forever, which is like, am I going to dump, you know, this? Am I going to go through the same channel for all of our customers and hope that it resonates? Hope that they respond? Hope they don't, you know, just ignore it? The reality is if you ask people what they want and how they want it, they'll tell you. You just got to ask the question, right. you know, and that's what a lot of the really successful brands are doing. Right. Um, Robert, Woodworkers Hardware has experienced some dramatic growth in the last year. And in fact, your company is now a two-time e-com forum speaker too, because we talked last year with your peer about building an e-commerce channel. And now you've experienced dramatic growth in this last year, which is theme of this panel. Um, one of the biggest drivers for you has been mobile. Um, and I think that given your industry, given the experience, you probably have some unique thoughts, perspectives on how that's played for you the last year. You want to share? Uh, yeah, with the mobile side, we actually kind of forgot about mobile for a little while. You know, you kind of get really focused. We all sit at our office, you know, 8-5. We stare at our computer. We got our PC. We don't really think about mobile. I never grab my cell phone at work. Huh. Don't tell my boss. But, uh, you know, every <laughs> once in a while you're, you're on there, but you're not looking at your own website on mobile. And finally, you take some extra time. You start looking at the analytics. And you're like, holy cow, now my desktop users are down to 50%. My mobile is up to 30%. And, well, that doesn't seem right because now my conversion rate on mobile is just way lower than it is on desktop. So we had to come at it another way. And we had to grab our team and be like, all right, we need a user experience. We need somebody else to come in and look at this. And... It was 27 pages that came back and said, hey, here's what we need to do. And I'm like, all right, let's start. And they said, well, we can do this in a month. And I said, I, I don't believe you, but OK, let's go. And <laughs> August 30th, done. Yeah. You know, it was, it was pretty amazing. And, it, and we've already seen those conversions grow up. And, and so by just sitting, stepping back from yourself, you know, looking at it and actually getting some extra help on that was, was pretty huge for us to actually come at it a different way. I think one of the things I'd, I'd like you to share is um, to talk a little bit about what Woodworkers Hardware does, because I think that one of the things you're exploiting is in your industry, there's probably some laggards uh, to adopting mobile and investing in that and, and some, of, some of the more advanced in your industry growth strategies. So talk a little bit about what your company does. I think everybody will really connect then how you're uh, ahead of the curve. Yeah, we sell cabinet hardware. So we got knobs, poles, drawer slides, kitchen organizers, um, sandpaper glue um, on our retail side. We, we run with folks that are just the homeowners trying to, you know, redo their kitchen a little bit, you know, say they want to move, sell their house. Then they said, you know, their handles are junk. So they finally go out and buy some new handles. You want to buy a new recycle unit. And so we get a lot of one-off customers, but we also get a lot of the, the home hobbyists that, that do stuff. We're actually finding that a lot of our customers are actually like 65 and male. That's not the best um, audience that you want because they're, get, <laughs> you know, they're, they're getting older. So you need to start filling in at the bottom and working your way up. And so by making that mobile experience better, which are the youth, the people in their 20s or 40s that are buying these houses now, these are the folks that you also need to, to come in and buy. And, and so we actually just, in the last couple of months, we've actually seen those numbers start to you know, level off a little bit where you're actually feeling it's not just, I got all the old guys buying, so. And I think that comment that the 65-year-old male is adopting via mobile reinforces my comment earlier about um, e-commerce is still growing. Right? Um, nobody is going to sit down at night and say, I'm going to shop more inconveniently uh, to go into a store if they don't have to, right? The, the omni channel, the, the blend of bricks and clicks, that's going to continue. But I think that the angst in the economy and the slowdown in the industry does not mean it's not growing, right? And you just proved that. Right. So, Let's say, by the way, that demographic was the same demographic at the concert last night, in case you're curious. <laughs> right. There might not have been shopping this morning on yeah. their phone. <laughs> 
<laughs> Jason, over to you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the growth and, and change you're having in your business. We talked about some technology side here. We touched on people in the build panel too, right? Like um, all three panelists talked about how important people are to a project. Well, as your business is morphing in terms of the balance between your retail bricks and mortar operation, the growth of your e-commerce operation, how have you managed the changes in your people and your team and, and what you're doing on a daily basis? Uh, yeah, let me back up a little bit because, um, so I came out of uh, a big box retailer. So I was in the buying offices and then I was in product development and I knew we had uh, e-commerce somewhere in another building and many floors of it, but <laughs> I never had to deal with it, thankfully. So what happened then is uh, I decided to do my own thing. I had enough of corporate life. The cube was uh, not attracted anymore to me. So I started Hammermade. So Hammermade's essentially a shirt shop. We do limited run. I work with the best mills in the world. Um, we manufacture great shirts. Um, and throughout that process uh, was my wife and I, and I would say the first website that we had was a WordPress site. And we had it because we needed to have it. Right, but the truth of the matter was our first store was in the Galleria and Edina here. And uh, people would come in and uh, they would say, hey, I saw this on the site, but I wanna see it and I wanna buy it, that, that whole type of thing. So for the next several years, we were able to scale, um, thankfully. And um, uh, next 10 or 12 years, we grew up to 11 locations throughout the US, uh, had about 75 employees. And um, within a matter of, I call it the, the five letter word, right? I'll take any four letter word compared to COVID <laughs> because COVID was really difficult on us. And so we went from 75 employees to five employees um, like overnight. And that uh, was the toughest conversation of my life. I was literally um, teary eyed telling my employees that, hey, we're gonna need to lay you off. And, so the next couple of years, as we all know, I had to readjust um, our strategy from retail and e-commerce, and e-commerce was literally the only thing that was open, mm -hmm. right? And so people still wanted to support us. They're very um, aware of what's happening, so on and so forth. And what happened is, uh, as we started growing, and um, uh, you know, years ago in 2008, 2009, my wife and I, and we added that team, and we built up everybody and we were able to hand all that stuff off, um, I like letting go. I know I'm not the expert at it, right? I had no problem saying, hey, you're really good at that. We had a couple internal people, um, several external people helping us, but when that happened, we had to take all those hats back on. So as we look now into where we're at over the last um, you know, 12 or 18 months, we're stabilized, regrowing, trying to hire people, um, and trying to fill those voids. But I guess it's been interesting for me to say, to, to build, rebuild, build again, it's been many different um, iterations of that. And I think what's cool about it right now is um, what we're dealing with and what we're working with now is so much more evolved than what we were left with in 2009. Um, even what we, I remember, you know, some of our biggest growing pains when we would have a big event or things like that would be, are, is the website gonna sustain, right? Are we gonna be able to hold the traffic? We'd be up all hours of the night trying to make sure that whatever prices we were gonna change were gonna actually happen morning of the live sale. So anyhow, it's, it's a bit of the build, rebuild, and um, you know, kind of keep going. Yeah, it's a little bit of like a ladder, like you go up one side, with one side then the other, et cetera. Yeah, and yeah. then someone pushes the ladder down. <laughs> <laughs> right, COVID, Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, Robert, I think that uh, one of the other things that you've done at Woodworkers is invest in that post-purchase experience um, and use that to reinforce your brand and grow your business. Do you want to share some of your insights and experiences there? Right there to uh, actually reach out and like ask people for their opinion on a product. I'm sure everybody buys a, you know, a shirt and you know, they're going to send you an email and be like, hey, what do you think of our shirt? Oh, your shirt's awesome. I love it. Well, we weren't really doing the review thing. and. So the only feedback you get is when somebody's upset. You know, they don't tell you, hey, the product was great. We once in a while you get those really nice people that do that, but more often than not, you just, you don't get any kind of feedback. So just trying to get more of a response from our customers and to, you know, to touch them one more time because to retain, we have a lot of just, they buy once and they're, and they're gone and we hope that they, you know, tell their neighbor, their friend, their relative, whatever that, you know, hey, this is a great place to pick up your kitchen hardware, you know, because they come over to their house, they see it, 
So to try to get some more of that feedback on products that work or don't, you know, to, to invest in actually sending out those automatic emails and get those responses to get that feedback, just to try to get some more, you know, touch with your customers to hopefully to get them to come back and buy more, maybe do another room or something to, you know, you got to retain them because once you got them, we do a great job. I mean, that's, that's the best part of our business is that we can, you order today, it goes out today. You know, where you can, we, can, we can turn and burn and we're awesome at shipping our, our warehouse. It's, it's nuts at three o'clock in the afternoon how fast they can move. You're, you're careful when you walk out there because you're going to get ran over by a cart. So, <laughs> right. 50 people out there moving product and it's, it's pretty automated. The tracks, you know, scanning guns and everything else, it's, it's pretty wild. But. So before I go to you with the question, that brings to mind one of the comments from a speaker last year, Eric Peterson from Center Power Sports sitting right there, one of our clients, one of our speakers last year talked about, don't forget the straw, um, you know, with that post-purchase experience because he had an experience going through fast food restaurant, um, and picked up his food, straw wasn't in there, uh, made the experience bad. They could have serviced everybody else that day super well. He didn't have a good experience and, and remembered it and talked about it, right? So you have that one post-purchase experience that's not good, that doesn't, that's, not gonna, that's not gonna give you a halo effect. Well, but that gives us, great feedback you know even negative feedback is still good feedback you don't want it but you accept it and you're like okay how do we learn and how do we do better and make sure we don't make that same mistake going forward for the next person that doesn't tell us because now it just keeps snowballing so i think that's a good segue to something i know you have a lot of both thoughts and, and exposure to with with what attentive does right and so how are brands using customer service to enhance their brand improve the customer experience in, increase retention. Uh, what are you seeing there? First of all, I don't know how I got this microphone. This is weird. But um, <laughs> so, you know, I would, I would first say that, like, we always talk about a mobile first, you know, economy. But there's, there's a huge segment of people who are like mobile only shoppers, like tons, right? So when you start thinking about customer service, and sort of the way I think about it, I guess, is how are brands dealing with those mobile only customers when it comes to customer service, right? You know, at the end of the day, I think the best brands that we see are leveraging, um, you know, for instance, we're in the mobile space. So they're leveraging their uh, customer service platform tied in to, you know, what we're doing at Attentive. Because if I'm a mobile shopper or if I'm part of your um, SMS program, let's say, and that's how I want you to connect with me, that's where I want you to live in the feed of my life. If I have a question, about um, a product or whatever, at my account or anything, I don't want a broken experience where now I have to hop out of that channel and I've got to get on my computer or use a chat bot or you know some sort of um, you know submission form. Like you know, it's it's just really incumbent on on the brands to make sure that however I'm telling you, I want you to communicate with me. Try to wrap your customer service into that too so I don't have to jump you know jump rails or jump channels um, because that's just a really disjointed experience right and I think that it is reflective of better business to think about it through that whole experience people get caught up on the the sexy side of the design and the pre-purchase experience and forget about that which has a tremendous impact on retention if nothing else yeah, you know the crazy thing is like First of all, customers ask a lot of lots of questions, right? Like even in our space, we're text message marketing. You'd be surprised at at how many times customers will ask random questions. But largely, I think when customers ask questions, they assume that they're going to go ignored by the brand because you know it goes to this black hole of where the questions go to die, basically. Um, so what we found though is that when they get a response to their question, it's generally there's generally like a 31 percent increase in revenue, which is huge. I mean, if, if all you had to do as a brand was answer my question through the channel that I'm interacting with you on, and that unblocked my ability to make that next purchase, to continue the purchase I have in my car, to answer whatever question I had about my account that'll let me transact again a week from now, like it's really, really powerful. So I think um, that would be sort of my, my view on the customer support part is just don't break that, right. don't break that, you know, that channel that you've already got you know, up and running with that customer. Make it easy for your customers to engage with you. That is it. Right. Um, so talking about engagement, let's bounce over to both of you to talk about uh, some of the growth strategies, acquisition, conversion, retention that you're both uh, investing in in both the companies. So let's start with maybe email marketing um, and how you guys are using email 
to, to grow the customer base, retain them, brand loyalty, uh, et cetera. So uh, maybe, Robert, do you want to go first? Um, well, with that, that email really trying to grow that piece for us and not just do that, um, what do you use, the spray and pray, you know, type to really get into that segmenting because we do have those two sides of wholesale customers versus the retail customers. So, did, you know, we can't, our wholesale customers, they want to know that a box of drawer slides is on sale because they're going to buy it and use it or a box of screws or something or the sandpaper. And then it's more of that retail side that they want to know if there's going to be some handles on sale or a certain organizer that they're going to use. So we really need to get them separated out, you know, just to get some better feedback again, you know, from our customers, you know, it all comes back to feedback, you know, to reach your customer service, you know, to answer those questions or be able to ask those questions. We have in-house customer service staff that's always there, you know, to answer those questions. Anytime you pick up that phone, they're there. We don't quite do the online chat, but, you know, that uh, email, you know, to try to segment some or some A-B testing. We've been doing some more of that too. You're doing A-B testing too. Yeah, with our, with the um, abandoned cart. Yep. You know, that's been working out. We we thought because we do the same day that we'd try to give them reminders at, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon, hey, you need to get your order in and we get about 30% clicks. And then the other half we have the next day, we're getting like 43% clicks mm -hmm. and more purchases are like, well, shoot here. We thought we were being smart by, you know, trying to get them the, the day of and actually we're better off to go the day after, so. Interesting. Jason, how about you? Yeah, so I would say um, transparently, we are really bad at this because throughout COVID, we went to emailing and just basically hitting as many people as we could hit because it meant dollar signs, right? So we got into a habit of doing that too much. We're backing out of that. Um, unfortunately, when you do that though, you lose a lot of your guys and the guy does not, our guy does not want to be bombarded with emails and bombarded, I mean, two or three a week. And, um, but yet when I look at, um, other brands in the industry, it seems like it's even more than that. So it's a little bit of a confusing message to me to hear my customers say that's too much, but then see so many other people out there that just keep on the gas. Um, so figuring that out, A-B testing, really um, putting more value into what does the customer want, how do they want to hear from us, when do they want to hear from us, um, those normal things. But I think beyond that, um, you know, email is, is something that we really want to focus on and get back to Again, hearing how he wants to hear from us. And the other thing I would say is, you know, retail is a, is a broad spectrum, but when we break it down into clothing, that's another mini spectrum, and then we break it down into men and women, that's totally different. Guys are way different in how they want to hear from a brand than women. Um, you know, quick example, my wife, we live here in Minneapolis. Um, there's a box on the stoop, you know, check it out. Oh, open, not me. Sandals. It's February. Why do we need sandals? Well, they were gonna be gone and this and that. I mean, what? Doesn't make any sense. A guy is like, he steps outside and it's like, whoa, it's hot. I need to go buy some shorts today, you know? I mean, he's not <laughs> doing that. So it's not, it's not the same thing, right? So I try to break it back down and think about the guy and like, what is he doing and how does he wanna hear it? And you know, at the same time, he needs to hear it. Um, but it's how and when, because when he does hear it and when he does experience us, I'm all about the guy. I started working in retail. I'm 48 when I was 15. I worked in men's retail for a hundred year old company, you know, and I, I've worked with guys enough that I know what guys like, don't like, and that's why I created the brand, right? right? And I wanted to create a brand because I don't want to sell other people's brands. I have no... I don't want to compete with anybody else that they can go to another store or another dot com and play that game. Forget it. I know what the guy wants. The problem I have is finding the guy, right? right? Because we don't have the bucket of money that a lot of big shirt brands, and obviously I can't buy key keywords that say shirts, right. you know? <laughs> Next great, I mean. So we have to come back and say, what are authentic ways? And um, just to elaborate that on a, a quick side story is, so birthday things. So I originally had seen um, my wife get some birthday messaging from a, a national retailer. Hey, it's your birthday. And I'm like, that's kind of a cool idea. And it was somewhere in my, that's kind of a cool idea. you know. And then what happened is one of our great, great, we have a customer service is kind of dead in a lot of stores. We try to stay away from that. So we have some really great people in the stores. And one of the people in our airport store in Minneapolis a guy came through on the regular and kind of came through and he's like, yeah, I need a shirt, uh, I'm going to Denver. And, uh, 
And he's kind of bummed out. And, uh, and they're like, okay, you doing anything in Denver? Are you going to go out? No, nah, nah, it's my birthday tonight, but I don't have any plans. And I'm just going to, you know, hang out. It's like, ah. So our employees um, proceeded to, on their own, call the hotel, talk to the hotel, say it was this guy's birthday, and then get a cupcake delivered up to the guy once he got to Denver. And um, so that kind of spurred this whole thing. There is something because guys, again, I'm just, I'm a guy, so I'm speaking to this guy. We don't celebrate a birthday. You get to a level and, yeah, I celebrate my kid's birthday. And they're like, whoa, you know, but it's my birthday. It's like, I don't know, it's my birthday. And, you know, so it's like just those little types of things to say, hey, it's your birthday. Celebrate it. And it's not, a, it's not truly about here's some kind of percentage off. Who cares? It's your birthday. And that, so then it became authentic to me. So then I could actually do it. It wasn't just somebody else's BS gimmick to get 15% off for you to buy a shirt. You know, that is a like, fantastic story. Yeah, that is one of so. the best stories I've heard on Ecom Forum stage. Cool. So kudos to your team for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Eric, let's, let's roll over to you and dig around on some of what the themes were in there about finding that customer that you're trying to attract, retaining that customer once you have them, um, you and I met a long time ago, and personalization was probably talked about either, maybe not even yet when we met, but not long after, and now it's real. So, yeah. and, and you guys are helping to power some of that. I like to think so. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know, when, when I think of like personalization, I guess, um, you know, it's been it's been thrown around for years and years, and, and like you said, maybe now it's it's getting slightly more real. The, the, I think the first thing I think of, and and this goes back to me being in the mobile space long before I was at Attentive. Um, I'm always thinking like sort of from the mobile point of view. Um, you know, I don't know. You have to kind of consider like if you're trying to personalize a message or you know any kind of outreach to a customer, like what are the vehicles and tools you even have to begin with to to do that, and what are the ones that like sort of lend themselves the best to personalization. And when I think about it, like I think of my phone because it's in my pocket all the time. And I'm sure with many here, you know, our phones are always in our pocket. Um, but it's like probably maybe the best vehicle for personalization, right? Because like, I don't know about you guys, I have one cell phone. Mm -hmm. I've got five email addresses. They're all my burner email addresses. <laughs> and you guys have them too. I mean, let's not, we're amongst friends. We all have those burner email addresses. Um, but we got, I've got one cell phone. I swear I don't think I've changed my phone number in 20 years probably. I don't know. I, I'm, I lived in, in Illinois for probably 10 years without changing from my Arizona number. You know, you just don't do that. I, we don't, sh I don't share the device with anyone. Um, it's always on. I'm always on it. Far too much. So like, what better vehicle could there potentially be for personalization? Not to mention that you can get all sorts of really cool other data, right? Like location data. That might be important. Might, might it be good for me to know, like, you know, if I'm sending messages out to someone in New York, let's say, and we have a pop-up shop or something going on, it would be good for me to have location data. The other thing from a, from, a person, uh, from a personal or personalization standpoint that I see being really, you know, fantastic around mobile is when your phone makes that sound, like you check it because you know it could be your wife or your husband or your, your son or your daughter, like you just, it's, it's a personal tool, right? That's how people get a hold of you. So I would just, I would throw it out there that like when you're thinking about personalization, it's not only about like platform and all of those sorts of things, but just think about like what's even the right vessel, right, to be, you know, thinking about personalization and if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, while you have the floor, I think another challenge that brands are facing are all the changes with uh, data and privacy, the ATT changes, you know, everything else that is removing access to first party data or at least reducing it. Um, Fake news. That's, <laughs> no, it's, 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 a, it's, it's crazy. Um, I'm sure any of the brands in here are having struggles. If, if, to be like a marketer, a marketer for a brand has got to be unbelievably difficult now. Um, it's way harder than it's ever been. And like all the legacy channels that everyone took for granted is, have become very difficult. Um, you know, a great example, I was like a diehard um, PC guy. I don't know why. What? I, was, I, was, I know. I, was a diehard, I worked at Microsoft for a long time, right? So I was a diehard PC guy and I had an Android phone forever. And then like four months ago, I like went full on geek into the Apple ecosystem. So I got a uh, MacBook Welcome Pro. To the mid I know, I know, dude. I know. 
<laughs> I'm getting there, man. Take it easy. So, um, so I got a MacBook Pro. I got an iPad Mini. I got an Apple Watch, which I'm not. I'm kind of ashamed about. Um, I've got an Apple Watch. Um, what else? Oh, I got an iPhone, right? But the, as I was setting it up, I was just dumbfounded that Apple is prompting me to make up fake email addresses as I'm setting it up, right? Like that speaks volumes that, you know, that big tech is really making your job harder and it's making my, you know, consumer side, uh, my ability to hide from you like easier, right? So it's, it's, it's a very difficult situation right now. So I think the whole idea of trying to have like owned data and first party data is more important than ever before. Um, you know, and you can get a lot of that data from your customers, right? Like, so we, we see some really cool examples where brands will ask very specific questions to their customers in like their SMS outreach, let's say. Like they, like let's say you're, I don't know, a sporting goods uh, company. You may ask your customer a specific question like, you know, hey, what are you into? Are you into tennis, basketball, baseball, soccer, whatever? And when, and when they reply to that, you can take that data and segment on it knowing that going forward, I'm not gonna be sending this person stuff about skiing. They said they're not interested in that. So the more of that kind of data that you can start to, you know, start to collect, Hopefully, you know, you could offset what some of the big tech companies are doing to make it harder for you to do your job at this point. Yeah, that was good, a lot, a lot there. Apple's taking a big part of their strategy and in, in future on privacy, in, in claiming that corner of big As tech. As a customer, it's amazingly easy to opt out of all of that stuff, right? Like, it, so we've got to change our, you know, our strategy as brands and as platforms to, you know, to, to sort of get around that. Jason, um, Omnichannel, let's, let's, let's explore that a little bit sure. with you. you. You touched on it when you did the rundown on, on HammerMade's history, yeah. but uh, given the change in mix between the focus um, on retail, bricks and mortar, over to the emergence of e-commerce as a priority for you, how have the strategies for each of those changed? Where are they converging? Yeah, um, I have to back up a little bit on this and say that so my, my first strategy as I came out of a big corporate world and I was trying to figure out how to get people into my shirts is that I would do small batch shirts, uh, limited around maybe 15, 20 pieces of a shirt. And if I knew you were a size large or 16, I'd put all those shirts in a hockey bag and I'd drop it off and say, hey, you know, check out which ones you like. And at that time, it was all, oh, they'd leave me a check, right? right? And I <laughs> Stitch would, fix before it existed. Exactly, right? And I would pick up the bag and then do the next thing. And um, so my strategy has evolved quite a bit from that. But as we go into, um, you know, I talked about the, our first store in 2009, WordPress site, kind of just had to have a .com just to have one. And then growing it, um, it being, you know, basically our number one store and even increasing through COVID, right, is basically what saved us. Um, having that. Um, and then we implemented more of the um, buy online, pick up and store, which ended up to be our headquarters because um, you couldn't go into a store to pick it up. So um, just trying to do both and and trying to figure out like, hey, how can we do this? What can we do in order to increase all those channels? But again, back to the guy, what's easiest for him? And so as we think about omni-channel, um, one of the ways that we grow into the future is airports. So, um, you know, that's where our guy is naturally. He doesn't want to go to the mall. He's not like, hey, take me clothes shopping. Sounds great. He's like, no, not a chance. Don't want to do that with, you know, the generalization. So, um, so you know, going after that, understanding that guy, going back into um, working with him, once we get that touch point there, and that's great because, again, I can't compete on shirts. And what I say is there's a ton of shirts out there that I say, where's your shirt made? Because people are like, this is a great shirt, right? I'm like, look at the back label. Oh, third world country, who, where? I mean, you're, you, you have a $5 shirt on and then you paid $95 in marketing, awesome. Guys don't know quality, they don't understand it, but when they come in and they touch our shirt and feel our shirt and they get exposure to that, they're like, oh wow, I didn't know that. You know, and so broadening that base helps us then build back to that guy as he travels to the airport. We'll have people that will stop in our store specifically to divert their flight to come into the store. We have people that'll hit us up from the gate and be like, hey, can you run me down a shirt? 
So it's that exposure that helps us grow that out and understand kind of like that continued true omni-channel of what our guy wants. I saw you pull back when you went to go touch Robert's shirt. I was going to say, so. what's wrong with my shirt? <laughs> <laughs> I need that discount code. Um, Robert, uh, you're one of the panelists that has a B2B part to the business, right? So can you tell us some of the differences you're seeing between how B2B and B2C are, are growing, how you're uh, operating them, the, the marketing strategies? What are some of the distinctions between the two? Yeah, it's it's pretty wild how much how different the you know B two B folks are than the B two C um, B two B. When you look at the Google Analytics, you know we were talking about mobile. You know everybody's on the mobile. Well, look at the analytics on our side um, for our B two B customers. It's almost ninety percent of them are there on a PC. They don't look at their phone. It might be the guys that are on the job site looking, um, you know, just because they need to pick something up or order if they're if they're the smaller shop, but with us having, you know, larger customers, it could just be a purchasing person that's buying. They get the order from the, uh, um, from their salesperson, hey, I need you to order this for the Smith job. And so they just go online and onto our website and order right away. They don't, they're not browsing. They're not, you know, trying to pick out different colors. They already know their part number and they know their quantity. And at that point, once our website came out, we had to change how it was looking for the purchasing agent because, you know, most websites you order an extra large men's white shirt. That's what you see on the top of that. But for our warehouse, it's a part number. You know, you need an A01950-3 and all of a sudden that wasn't showing up in the cart. Well, now the purchasing person there is panicking because they're not sure if it's the right thing. Now they got to click and then go back. So we get feedback from them and it's like, oh, well then. Go back to the developer, let's throw that SKU, you know, so it shows up here in the checkout for you. Now they're happy with that. Now we need to get the PO to show up on their um, yeah. confirmation because you just have that order number that gets created on your platform. So it's been a lot of work and, you know, it, it's been growing well, but I mean, you, you get, I think you get really good feedback from your B2B customers because they want to buy from you. They're gonna buy from you two, two or three times a day you know, maybe just once a week, they'll just keep adding stuff to their cart because they know they got their delivery truck coming the next week. And if, if they're having problems, they're going to call us or when our outside salesperson walks in, is like, hey, we've been on our new website. It's really cool. They're like, ah, well, I wish you could do this. So they call us up and we say, hold on, let's talk to our developer. Hey, can you guys do this? Because you can't be the only one that's having this problem. And we've, we've made our website so much better just from our customer feedback from their, their pain points. Yeah. that really weren't that big of a lift. Sometimes yeah. I, my developer had it fixed in like three days and I was like, yeah. man, why couldn't somebody tell me this a year ago when we launched? Because I could have fixed your problem a long time ago, but. It, that B2B buyer is different, but they're expecting a better experience now than they ever did before, rightfully right. so. Yeah. Right, yeah, because they're not, they're not shopping on the weekends. You, you look, again, you look at the analytics, they're there at seven o'clock on Monday morning and they leave at five o'clock every day. Yeah. And you can see it on the weekends, there's nobody on our website Monday. Yeah. Well, on a Friday, it's, yeah. it's, it's wild. I mean, it's fun, you know, you get the, all the blue squares are all just, you know, during the week and, you know, on your retail side, it's bringing all over the place. So, you know, yeah. you try to market to them or send your emails, you only want to send it when they're, you know, in the office because it's just their work computer, not on their burner email address that they're using, so. Well, we're approaching the end, <laughs> so let's wrap up with, uh, with our Shamrock round. And let's go with a piece of advice you'd like to leave the audience with, whether they're a merchant, a peer, an industry uh, representative. Um, Jason, you wanna kick off with a piece of advice you'd like to leave everyone with? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things I think of in relating it back to fashion is um, thinking about e-commerce and something that you wore 10 years ago or something that you did 10 years ago um, in e-commerce is most likely not working now or in the future. But I think for myself, there's some limitations, whether it was money, um, but I think a lot of time it's just the awareness that something I've done in the past um, or worn in the past doesn't apply anymore. So who do you have that's giving you honest feedback because I think we can lie to ourselves and be like, yeah, that's okay. The guy probably doesn't recognize that. Or, oh, that's all right. It's, you know, but you need that honest feedback yep. in, in life and in both of those categories. Find your people, per Laura Boyd's comment earlier. People tell you have food in your teeth. Yeah. Robert. Um, I guess for me, patience. I mean, it, it's tough as a, as a seller, you know, because you get, you talk to all these people. I mean, I don't know how many times I get a phone call you know, hey, you need to come over and use our, our checkout option. You need to come over and use our extension, our email thing. And hey, I can, 
they, they stop just this short of promising it because they know they can't. But they're telling you right now that this is going to increase your ROI. And it's like, well, you know, I have expectations that we do want to increase our sales. My expectations aren't going to change. You just got to extend that timeline a little bit because it takes a little bit for, for that to grow. So having some patience, you know, your you know, developers are working hard to make those changes. Everybody, everybody wants your site to grow because it, it's good for them too. But sometimes you just got to have a little bit of patience and try not to yell at the people that are trying to help you. So, <laughs> Eric, close us out. No pressure. Um, yeah, no, I would just, I would think that from a growth perspective, um, you know, just try to keep it conversational. Like if that's not something that you're doing now with, you know, with your, your prospects and your, and your customers, ask them the questions, you know, find out what they want from you, how, when, and where they want to hear from you. How often do they want to hear from you about what things do they want to hear from you? Ask those questions because guess what? They will answer you. And you'll have just a, a way more fruitful relationship with those customers going forward if you can assure yourself and you can, you know, assure them that you're sending them the things that they want, that they want you to send them when they want those things to come through and through which channel. So, again, spray and pray, like I mentioned earlier, that is, that is like yesterday, that is yesterday's stuff. We need to figure out um, how we're going to know more about these customers and deliver on their expectations, even though they may be totally unique from person to person. Yeah. Thank you. Let's give the panel a round of applause. You guys can exit stage left. I'll take that. <laughs> Don't forget to get your speaker gift, that badass ring. And we're running only slightly behind, which I think is my fault. So we're not going to do the, the break that's meant to be 15, 20 seconds. And we're going to move directly into Lizzie. Uh, go ahead and enter the stage, Lizzie. So we just had a panel that talked about growing your e-commerce channel. Now we're gonna hear from our spotlight speaker who will talk about growing our e-commerce channels, the Senior Manager of Ecosystem Marketing at Clavio, Lizzie Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I think that panel set me up very nicely uh, because I'm about to tell you how to actually do what they're talking about, which is really exciting. So if you um, haven't heard of Clavio, Clavio was built on three ideas. There is a database layer, there is a learning layer, and there is an experiential layer. So that's all about taking every single piece of data from across every touch point of the customer journey and making it super useful uh, and so that you can actually leverage it and make it actionable. What's more important that I have to talk to you about is Customer first marketing. So what they're just talking about, everybody's mind is cookies, not the delicious morsels that everybody loves, but unfortunately those things that everybody has relied on for so many years. So back in the early 90s when the web was created, every website owner was saying, who is visiting my website, which is awesome. So in 1994, the HTTP cookie was created and it took about five seconds for big tech to say, money, like we're gonna make money off you. So about 30 years go by, like I wanna say like I wanna 25 years and nothing happened. It was just continuous pendulum swing for big tech, taking all of the data, using it, and then social media came along and then it started to get really, really creepy. Um, you can't go on Instagram right now without Googling something else and then getting an ad for it. Am I right, everyone? Yes, yes. But now it's so obvious that there are regulatory concerns. GDPR came out. We're all concerned about how we're actually using them. And I hate to break it to you, but cookies are eventually going to go away. And even if they don't, even if it's like a false alarm type of situation, we shouldn't be relying on these third-party cookies. What we should be doing is way less stalking and way more talking. So what we were talking about before in the last panel was talking to your customers, actually having a relationship with them. What a concept. Really exciting stuff, just really not being creepy. I mean, it's, it's like you tell one person in a whisper that you're pregnant and all of a sudden every single ad you see is for an entire child's lifetime of clothing. Like, who needs that? Customer first marketing is a strategy that puts the wants and desires of your customer, not your bottom line, at the forefront of what you're doing. So really understanding what they want, what they care about, and making that your marketing. Because marketing should be so simple and so easy that people want to buy from you. It's like that's, your job should be done from the customer itself. 
So what I want to talk to you today is about five phases that you can actually go home and implement. So hopefully tactical examples you can take from today and go from guessing what your customers want to actually knowing what they need and potentially before they even know they need it, which is like gold star, you can go home with an A+. Plus. So there's five phases, as I said. We're talking about data, so number one, first and foremost, there is going to be so many opportunities for you to collect data from your customers, to learn from your customers, and so figure out what you need to solve first. It could be a big goal of like, you need to decrease your acquisition costs, or you need to increase your retention, or you wanna convert those first-time visitors into first-time purchasers. That is a really great goal, but set your goal, and that should be your first step to customer first marketing, is understanding what data you should be going out to get. The second step is the inspiration and architecture phase. So this is one of the most important phases of this, which is learning from the people that you're marketing to. So this could be surveys or quizzes, and we have tons of integrations with, you know, like Octane AI or anything like that that can take quizzes and data that comes in, you can learn from them. This is a really great example from one of our customers. Um, once a customer is signed up to their subscription for three months, they have a segment that's their VIP segment that it automatically triggers a flow in Clavio to the user, and it's from the CEO directly, automated, of course, uh, and it says, hey, you've been a VIP customer. Why? Why do you want to? I want to chat with you. And that is a link to a Calendly. So she actually takes 15 minutes out of her day, obviously, I'm sure she prioritizes some days that she has more or less, and she talks to her actual customers that are buying from them for at least three months to understand why, why are they coming back so often. She says that that's the best 15 minutes of her day because she is hearing directly from her customer what they should be doing and what they should be doing better. That is something that you can build and make it segmented and automated really easily. Um, but the key there is to look for patterns within those insights. So you're starting to collect all this data, you're hearing feedback. The next step is actually implementing that. So you figure out, this is an example from our customer Cheeky Wipes. They discovered they have a bunch of different use cases. They have you know, babies, women, different people that are using their wipes for different things. They don't always cross over. So what they realized was that they need to find out why people are buying those wipes and start collecting data. So before they even started making you know, the, the marketing experiences to match that, they needed a form to actually collect it. So the first thing that they did was on their welcome series, the pop-up when they first come in, is they started to collect, what are you interested in? So they just added one more thing instead of just their email address to be collecting at the forefront. And what that led to, which is the next phase, which is the automation phase, is creating three different welcome series based off of the three top three most requested um, items on the, the pop-up form. So that way they know that, you know, if you're coming in for women's needs, you're not getting the same thing for babies. Very different. So it's just a small thing where you can really scale out what you're doing and make it so that it feels really personalized for the person that's coming in. Another really great example of automation, I've used this for like a number of years because I just think this is so cool. SandCloud, they have the best towels if you don't know them. Uh, this is something that they, they realized from their information that their products were not selling great in the wintertime. Towels, crazy, use them on the beach. What they did learn is that if they used data and they started collecting data for location, they could start segmenting by climate and by geo. So they took the same product, reimagined it, used dynamic blocks in Clavio and were able to send the same email but based off of the geo and the climate that those people were in, they got a different image. So the one on the left goes to anyone in warm climates, jealous, I'm from Boston. Anyone on the right, probably here in Minnesota, anyone in Boston, gets the one that has the same towel as a warm and cozy tapestry. So just a really cool way of being able to take data and then making it scalable so that on a very widespread, very, very broad way, you're able to connect that person in a very, basic way. So as I said, 
five phases, and the last one is repetition. So you're never done actually asking your customer, talk to them, listen to them, look at the data. I mean, we had the example about the uh, abandoned cart, the open rate that we are just talking about in the last panel. Great example, really easy way to quickly test and see what's working and continue to iterate because your email marketing, your SMS marketing, your entire website depends on you being able to uh, go on the fly and you're doing it for your customers. So just to summarize, as before, I know that we have a happy hour coming up and a really great talk next. Um, Cookieless future, we have to stop relying on third party, start talking to your customer. People are going to be the powerful most tool that you have. Connect with those customers. It's all about the data that you are asking, you are collecting, and you are using in a smart way. And decide what data matters, because there is so much data that is out there that it can be overwhelming. So be sure to think about what you actually need, set goals, and prioritize what you're talking about. And that's it that I have. My name is Lizzie. It's great to see you all. So, thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. Appreciate it. I'll take a clicker. Oh, yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, we're, we don't have a happy hour beginning in a little while. Happy hour's already started, so grab your drink if you'd like. Um, we're going to move straight into our last spotlight. Um, if you think tax is no fun, you're probably right. Taxes aren't fun, right? But I like to say everything green's a write-off, so I'm not a voice of reason here. But we're going to bring on someone from Avalara who is fun, and he's going to talk about B2B, which Robert touched on a little bit in our grow panel. Uh, so really looking forward to this because I think B2B is a massive market that we need to make sure to be paying attention to. So let's welcome to the stage the manager of strategic alliances, e-com and payments for Avalara, Tom Earhart. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Stage is yours. Thank you, uh, Irish Titan, for giving me the opportunity to, to come and speak today. It's a, it's a lot different than you know what I usually do behind my desk at my home office. Like, I have pants on, right? This is this is great, right? Um, but like Darren said, taxes probably aren't super fun. It's not super great. Um, but what we're finding, like you said, B two B is exploding online. And what we are also finding is that a lot of companies try to take that B two C experience, apply it to B two B and they're kind of falling short. Now, there are some great things that we can grab from B2C and a place it in the B2B atmosphere that is gonna be really dynamic for our customers and our shoppers. You know, things like uh, easy navigation, understanding your buyer, a dynamic search functionality, being able to find the products that they're looking for um, with great keywords or using different things. That's, that's gonna be obviously very, very important. Uh, merchandising your products really well. Uh, great photography. You know, some, we, we talked to some folks last night about uh, great like th 3D imagery and being able to spin things around. Product attributions we we're talked about today about really having a great detail of those products so they can make sure that. And I think what Robert said earlier about like the SKUs versus the descriptions was that really hit home for me. I didn't, didn't realize something like that. But also like the kind of their paths and their workflows. Um, how, do they, how do they work through your website? Um, th these are things we study in the B2C world, but not so much in the B2B. Uh, customer accounts is phenomenal. Like, I, I think all B2C websites are using customer accounts, and hopefully their, their customers are creating accounts and being long-lasting stickiness and repeat customers. Um, that is also something that's extremely important in the B2B, B2B world. Uh, probably more and more as we see repeat customer, reorder, like the, that, um, that rebuy type situation on, on, online. But the one, I'm the tax guy, right? Hit, stay in your lane, bro. Like, like, come on, like, this is like, this is what I do. So the compliance. Now, B2C, sales tax compliance, hey, it's one of the, the holy three. You need shipping, you need payment, you need tax and cart, right? You need to calculate the right sales tax. In the B2B world, oftentimes, sales tax compliance kind of falls short. Um, and that's mainly because most people say, hey, I'm selling to a religious organization or a hospital, maybe a government entity. They don't, I, I can sell to them tax free. Uh, I don't have to charge them tax. And many e-commerce platforms even have like a checkbox, like, oh, this customer, check, tax free, no problem. Which is great to comply with taking care of not charging them tax. But on your end, on the, on the merchant's end, on the seller's end, it doesn't, that doesn't fly with sales tax compliance. Um, and and the, the, the thing about sales tax compliance is that it's, the onus is on the merchant to make sure they can prove why they didn't charge tax 
versus the buyer proving why they shouldn't have to be charged tax. So it's on the merchant to make sure that they are getting that proof, and that proof is through sales exemption certificates. Every company buying tax-free gets a sales exemption certificate. And why this is important, specifically in e-com, is because it's taking those back office responsibilities that usually the controllers or the finance folks, that they have to you know, manage. Uh, you know, we talked to a lot of customers that they have a big file cabinet in their office and you pull it open and that's where all the paper sales tax compliance stuff is, is in there. Um, but in e-com, you know, the, hopefully the purchases are fast. Hopefully it's someone that's coming to your website for the first time. They really want to get that order in and they need it quickly. But they also want to buy it tax free. So as the merchant, you kind of have to figure this out. How are we gonna do this? How are we gonna capture what we need to capture and make a dynamic, great experience? So it's really been thrust into the, into the, into the user experience and we, we wanna to try to help to make it easy. And that's what uh, you know, our, our company has tried to do. Um, but it's something that you just probably have to think through. And it's part of that discovery and that persona, buyer's persona development that you have to do. How are they, how can we get the information we need to be compliant and make a dynamic, great experience for them? So um, there's really two ways to do this. And um, kind of, it's kind of like Tom's story time, fireside chat time. I, 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 so take with me on, on this journey. Uh, I'm a first time buyer coming to your website. I know I need a product that you're selling and I know I'm gonna use this product to put with the product I'm making to sell to the end consumer. That allows me to buy sales tax free. So I'm coming to your, your, your website for the first time. You've got great pictures. I was able to spin the part around. I know it's the exact one. I saw the fittings. will match up perfectly with the fittings that I need. That's great. I got all the parameters. Everything's great. And then I go to, um, I put it in my cart, and uh, maybe I go through a setup where I set up a customer profile, and, and all that's, that's phenomenal. Um, and I'm there and I'm like, great, but it's charging me sales tax. I don't need to, I don't, I don't get charged sales tax. I, 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 what's going on here? So they're stuck. They're like, do I just go somewhere else where I know that I don't have to charge sales? Or do I, do I just buy it because I need it and get, take the TED on the tax and um, maybe I call the, the, maybe I call the company back afterwards and say, hey, here's all my paperwork. Can I get that sales tax that I had to pay back? not a great experience. Or even worse, as Robert kind of talked about, the buyer isn't really the shopper. The shopper's putting stuff in a cart, and then the buyer that had purchasing is coming through, and they're actually making the purchase on the back end, um, which is a whole nother set of kind of user experience that we need to think about. How do we create a cart that we can save and maybe send to someone? How do we create a shopping list in the customer profile that we can then give to someone else with access to go in and make that purchase at a different time? Some of the things that we need to think about through that user experience, um, there's, there's great ways to accomplish this. And, and most of the time, it's usually just like a, a simple like wizard that you put in the, in the cart, maybe a link that you check out to, a, it takes you outside where you can fill out all the sales tax compliance information, make sure that everything's valid, everything's validated. You're capturing it on your end, so you're compliant. They're, they, they've got their sales tax exemption certificate saved in their customer profile, so they can come back any time, and it's set there, and it's good, and they can just walk through the, the checkout process. These are the things that we kind of need to think about and think through. And, uh, and kind of, I was, the, the last point I have on the, on the screen here is really that finance team, and um, Greta said this perfectly earlier, and it, I, I was thinking it from a tax perspective, so we talk really like the finance, the controllers, but it could be really anyone in this company. You need that champion, and you really want to bring them in early to the process to understand what they need. I have seen great B2B websites, projects torpedoed by finance because they make a great dynamic website. They spend a lot of time in the development. It's beautiful. And they're like, this is great. This is going to open up a huge sales channel for us. But we can't open ourselves to that much liability, that much audit risk, because we're not doing what we need to do to be tax compliant on the back end. So they really go hand in hand. Get them in the process earlier. Treat them like a customer. How are you going to fit, meet the needs of your customers and also your internal finance team customers to make sure everything works out perfectly together? And the, the, 
I'll kind of end here. Um, two reasons. One, I'm second to last before the real party starts, and I want to get there. And, and secondly, because um, when I read this statement uh, by Brian Beck, and if you don't know Brian Beck, he is a phenomenal e-commerce B2B expert in the field. Uh, he's got phenomenal stuff out there, great books, uh, uh, does a number of webinars a year. He's a, he's a, he's a force in this area. But in, in this quote, you know, in a nutshell, what he's really saying is, hey, if you just take B2C um, my, mindset and mentality and apply it to B2B, you will not get the same right outcomes that you want and you deserve. So let's rethink this. Let's rethink the customer journey, the buyer profile, and let's make some changes because just like Robert said earlier, the B2B customer is a lot different than B2C. And we want to see you all be successful and compliant you know, for your, for your taxes on the back end as well. I'm Tom Earhart um, from Avalara. If you have any questions, happy to have a conversation. Again, Darren, wherever you are, uh, thank you for the opportunity. This is right behind me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> thank you. All right, so um, am I mic'd up okay? Because I changed in the back and they didn't know I was gonna do this. Okay, so we are now moving into the finale of the show and it's actually my favorite part of Ecom Forum every year. It's our entrepreneurs panel, um, formerly known as our entrepreneurs panel. Now we call it our hustle panel. But before we do that, um, let's explain a little bit about why we've changed the name because entrepreneurs panel would indicate that the other panels aren't entrepreneurial and that's just simply not the case. You heard great entrepreneurial ideas from the build panel, from the grow panel, from all the spotlight speakers. What this panel has emerged to be doing over the, um, to be covering uh, is what the power of e-commerce does to enable solopreneurs to turn their side hustle into their main hustle, okay? And you're gonna hear that from both of our panelists. And you heard that actually from Jason earlier, from Hammermaid, right? Um, so this hustle panel, it's not about the, the um, hustle mindset of getting up at five, being at work by six, working till nine. That, that's not what it's about. Um, it's about the hustle mindset of using e-commerce to turn your side hustle into your main hustle. So let's welcome to the stage our hustle panel. Um, go ahead and come on on board. Get up here. See this, everyone? All right. All right. This is also why it's my favorite part of the panel. Um, this outfit actually is the power of e-commerce because you would be surprised. If you go Google green fur coat, look what you can get. It's fake fur, but you can find a green fur coat. And shout out to one of our clients, uh, Texas Custom Boots. Mark is the founder, solopreneur, who turned uh, his business or his side hustle into a main hustle. These green cowboy boots are courtesy of Texas Custom Boots. So this right here is the power of e-commerce, right? And these two lovely ladies are the power of e-commerce. So uh, let's go ahead and kickstart this conversation. Like I said, this is my favorite be because you can tell the vibe is starting to change. Because it was so stuffy before. Um, okay, let's go left to right with introductions. Nancy, introduce yourself to the crowd, please. Buongiorno, everyone. <laughs> okay, oh, y'all can do better than that. Buongiorno, everyone. <laughs> Okay, that's what I'm talking about. And for all of you bromancing back there, come and sit down. Y'all need to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> I am Nancy Corsa. I'm the CEO and founder of Black Business Enterprises, which is an organization that helps people of color get out of poverty through e-commerce, actually. And I absolutely love what I do. I was born and raised in Italy, and I am awesome. <laughs> Susan, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. As he said, my name is Susan. I'm from DC. Any DC people in here? But I was raised in Twin Cities. Any Twin Cities people in here? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I do everything. Um, I am, uh, I think of different ways to just build different businesses. I'm a small business trailblazer. 
Um, and I just, I just love thinking of ways to help people and start different businesses to solve their problems. So, so we're, we're going to start with Susan. Um, Susan, you and I only recently met uh, when we were starting to put the event together, right? And I read about you in a publication because you were a finalist for an award. Uh, quick read your bio there, was really impressed met with you and was even more impressed. You have a really inspiring story, the, acts, the absolute epitome of what we want on this Hustle panel and Power of E-Commerce. Talk a little bit about that inspiring story. Yes, yeah, so as I said, I started different businesses. So the first business I started was called Wrapped in My, My Roots. It's a hair accessory line that I started after I had my daughter. So it was around COVID and I saw how a lot of hair salons were shut down, and so I started it out, and it did really well. Um, and then after Wrapped in My Roots did really well, I was able to create Comfortum. And um, after I had my son, I just kind of thought about it, and I was like, there's not a lot of comfortable maternity clothes. And I was like, I can't do this again. I'm not going to go the second time around and be uncomfortable. So I tried looking for different options. I couldn't find anything. So I thought, why not? Like, why not create Comfortum? So I was able to do that. And it's a way that I've been able to increase um, diff and have different streams of income. Um, and because of that, I'm building generational wealth for my children as well. So it's, it's a plus. Not only am I solving issues that people are having, I'm also building something and legacy for my children as well. Round of applause for that. <laughs> We could end right there, but we're not going to, because trust me, um, there's a lot of personality on this panel. So Nancy, right, you already unveiled a little bit of that personality. So um, you have done some really inspiring things with black business enterprises and your own story. Share a little bit of that. Sure. So um, I was born and raised in Italy, as I stated. I came to America the first time right before 9-11, and we lived in Teaneck, New Jersey. I'm going to give you the shortest, because I see the timer there. 9-11 um, happened, and my mom was like, ah, America's ending. We're going back to Italy. So we left, came back again, and uh, we moved to Minnesota. And I was like, no, thank you. I don't do snow. <laughs> So I picked up and took an Amtrak train from here to California, and I said, Mom, I'm going to make it. I'll see you later. Now, because of 9-11, I was undocumented because all immigration, everything shut down. So I had no idea what to do. Uh, so in California, I started cleaning houses. So I was, your girl was scrubbing toilets. And I, I did not look this fabulous, but inside I did. <laughs> so... Um, but there I quickly realized that business can save your life, and that's what it did for me. Um, and that's really where Black Business Enterprises was birthed. I really realized that education and business could really take people out of that poverty, uh, stricken reality that some people are living in, and that really America is the land of dreams, at least for people like me. And e-commerce is one of the biggest things. Um, this is not a prop, y'all. It's beautiful, isn't it? For the low, low price, uh, I actually made this. And this was the very first product that I've ever sold. And I made a whopping $200,000 just with these uh, African fans. And they're bridal fans, but I use it for everything, guys, because nobody's getting married anytime soon. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I sold these as well when I was a flight attendant. And this, on e-commerce, is actually what helped me survive day to day. And I was charging $65 for them. I didn't know anything about e-commerce or building a website. I didn't even know about taxes. Hey, Mr. Avalara, I didn't know anything about taxes. Avalara. They still, Avalara, they, they still took them though, but I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> IRS knocking on my door tomorrow. But it, it, that really inspired me to share that with everyone else. And that's my story. There's much more to it. But what I really want to convey is anything and everything. And also show what, whatever it is that you're trying to, it's not a word, but I'm going to use it. E whatever your e-commerce in, make sure you bring it out to the world. Okay, this is part of me. I actually take one everywhere I go, different colors, whether people like it or not, whether it's appropriate, church. Where's the green one? 
I do have a green one now, but I don't want to take the spotlight off of that coat. Because, <laughs> Lord, I'm so glad we get to fun you. <laughs> so, round of applause for Nancy as well. Uh, the world needs more Nancy and more Susan. So, uh, honored to have them on the stage. Like I said, this is clearly the favorite uh, part of the, the event. It's the most loose. Feel free to grab a drink if you want, but try to keep it down so we can, we can talk. Um, but this is, this is the whole reason that uh, we are here, right? To celebrate e-commerce achievements to date and inspire those yet to come. So, Nancy, uh, talk a little bit. So you talked about your own e-commerce journey. Uh, talk a little bit about how Black Business Enterprises is also creating that for others. Absolutely. So I really started that, uh, again, out of defiance, right? A uh, notable CEO said, there's not enough talent in the black pool. So I said, well, let me create the biggest pool you've ever seen in your life. And I can't even swim. <laughs> And by that, I mean, um, I decided, I, I grew a community of 3.6 million members. So I decided, well, let me create a directory. And I taught myself how to build a website and create a directory so that everyone could jump in our pool and find talent. Because when we're talking about diversity and supplying diversity, there's a ton of diversity out here. This is Minnesota. Yes, this is Minnesota. So there's a ton of diversity out there and I just wanted to create that. And all of my members have their own website, their own e-commerce uh, website that they need support with. So I wanted to create one single space. And right now we have 72,000 members on the directory. One of the largest actually, um, even, even larger than Google. Anybody wanna write them to give me an offer? I will sell it. <laughs> because I'm tired. Um, but it's really large and we continuously add to it. Um, and our members are actually able to showcase their talents through our website. So when we're talking about e-commerce, that, that is the main reason why I started the directory so that people could actually showcase that. Just building a website is not enough anymore. Right. You need other channels to be found. So go on it right now, y'all. Blackbusinessenterprises.org. Uh, Susan, over to you. So you gave a great rundown on your story that brought you here, and you touched on um, how it's impacted you, but let's dig a little bit deeper on what that has enabled for you um, as a mother, family, et cetera. So actually, I'm going to go back to Nancy real quick and say I'm actually a member too. So, But um, e-commerce has really given me the ease that, that I'm able to to take care of my family, I'm able to go to school, I'm able to just do anything, um, I, anywhere, like not only in the comfort of my own home, just while I'm going shopping, I can get orders. It's just really comfortable. Um, and I know that I'm actually catering to my customers too, by being on that platform, I'm able to be creative, they're able to see my shop. I don't have to just start uh, actual in, in person store, I can do that from anywhere. So I really love the flexibility that that gives me. And I think as our resident e commerce practitioner, I would say that at this point you're more of an e commerce enabler, right? Uh, uh, which, which is uh, fabulous. You're a practitioner, right? Um, so, first of all, I think you may have touched this, on this in your introduction, but you have not one but two e commerce businesses, right? Um, and so, talk, talk about both of them, particularly the second, and how that is yet again an example of you turning a side hustle into a main hustle. So yeah, um, as he say, as he stated, I launched um, Comfortum as well, which was a maternity line. If you didn't get it the first time, but yeah, it's really um, it's has really benefited me um, financially, just helping, being able to just be a work from home mom where I can just take care of my kids and do that and then take care of my entire family. I just really love that. And then not only that, I'm also catering to mothers all across the world that are telling me that this is something that's um, comfortable for them and they have easy access to my maternity clothes as well. So people that usually wouldn't really think about, which I didn't think about it the first time around um, to just have maternity clothes. I try to wear our traditional, I'm Nigerian, so we have this traditional wear, and it was so hard for me to just take care of my child while I was in that. And so I was just like, you know, I have to, I, I need a better 
platform where I can just offer this to mothers um, so that they're able to do what they're able, you know, to cater to their family. And it's something that's stylish and something that um, is easy for them to do as well. So. Okay, I have to say, Susan just said she could reach anyone, anywhere in the world. That's what I love because I grew black business enterprises. And for example, um, just in Italy, we have 12,000 members. And I did that right from my computer. Yeah. You can reach just about anyone. That's what I love about what you said. It, the power of e-commerce is, is not just your next door neighbor. It's absolutely anyone. Right, right. And it allows you the opportunity to take that passion and build a business around it, right? So you were home and with that entrepreneurial spirit and heart and mindset that you have, you're like, hey, I can start another business. Um, and that, that just doesn't happen uh, as frequently as it should because I think not everybody's aware of that, right? Celebrating the achievements and inspiring those yet to come. So where do you see, let's start with you, Nancy. Where do you see black business enterprises in three to five years if, if Google doesn't come along and buy you? <laughs> I'm just giving them in the directory. Let's make that clear. I'll take offers from Yelp too, y'all. License it. Don't sell it. <laughs> License it. <laughs> Anybody want to be my lawyer? Um, well, I see us as a global, global community of people of color getting together, educating each other, no excuses taken over. Um, and if I can dive a little deeper into that, I think I told you when I first moved to Minneapolis, I would not be let in the building that I worked in because they said I didn't look like I belonged in there. And you know, I'm raw, y'all. You're going to hear it all. So that's what happened. So I want black business enterprises to be that entity where everyone feels welcome and even though it's called Black Business Enterprises, all of you got some black in you now. I mean, look at you right now. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but this man, he's blacker than you know. But I want everyone, <laughs> I love that I make you laugh. I want everyone to feel welcome, but also I want people to know where to go. Because I know a lot of people want to, uh, you know, offer resources. And okay, I want to I wanna be able to use those diversity dollars, which by the way, I'll freely take. Okay, um, and I want for us to stop segregating and just really get together and have wonderful conversations and make it bigger, better, global. So, and I need everyone's help to do that. Just talk about it and come and see us. Or conversations everybody can have like you and I can have. We have some really deep conversations. <laughs> right, right. Not for public consumption. No. Um, Susan, what about wrapped in, uh, wrapped in my roots and comfort them? What do you see in three to five years? So three to, from three to five years from now, I see wrapped in my roots. Right now, it's a hair accessory line. I would hope that it's a fashion line. And with um, Comfort M right now, it's a maternity line. I would love for it to be actual family line. So um, a family clothing line for just everyone. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I see um, in the future. Yeah. Uh, so just so everybody knows, because um, we will end on time, if not a little bit earlier, because this code is hot. Um, so we are not going to run long, um, but now let's do a little bit of shamrock round for group discussion. Uh, if you had a lucky three-leaf clover and could go back three to five years and change one thing or avoid a mistake, what might it be? Uh, Susan, you want to go first? Of course, I would love to. So if I could go back, something that I would change is that I would have started my businesses sooner. Um, and I wouldn't have listened to people that just looked um, at my ideas and just thought it wasn't enough or my name, oh, this is a funny name or you're not going to reach people with that um, or this, is, this should be your target audience because I've expanded my target audience. When you hear Wrapped in My Roots, you think maybe this lady is just selling to black people. No, I'm selling to everyone. So I really just um, enjoy the fact that I've just branched out. I don't just stay in a box and um, yeah. Nancy? Yes, that deserved a clap. Um, for me, I would say just be more fearless because... You seem so, <laughs> you know, that's a problem. I'm scared of the boogeyman. Um, be more fearless because, for example, I just had a, a, a gala, gala, however you say it, and I had all colors in the room. But before, I never, I never um, had the guts to go to my white friends and say, hey, I need you to be here and clap for me. 
And I did that this year and I felt like that was fearless. And I didn't start doing that till lately. And they had a ball, literally. And just having everyone in that room um, just reminded me that we cannot jump into business with fear. We have to first be teachable, number one. And second, not be afraid to ask people for help and, and for whatever it is that you need. Uh, because people are usually are willing to help either with their presence or with their claps, laughter. Thank you, everybody. Um, so just be fearless. And I know you said one thing, but I got another. <laughs> I'm not going to rein you in. <laughs> I would say the next thing is um, I sold my very first cleaning company when I was undocumented. <laughs> Y'all don't call immigration on me. They don't care about me now. I am an American citizen. Nothing on the stage can be reported. <laughs> I'm a right. proud American. Um, it was their fault, y'all. But uh, <laughs> I wish I would have asked for help from people that already had businesses because I was lowballed. So I think it's, it's yeah. accepting help and asking and not be so proud about your baby. You know, you have to kind of throw your business out, boom, and be like, okay, you're over there. I'm not so attached to it. You cannot be afraid to step away from your business and let other people kind of lead you or um, when you're too close to it, you just don't see the answers sometimes. So that's what I would change. Another round of applause for this panel. We're not even done yet, and um, I vowed that I wasn't going to talk about being back in person now because like, I think that's kind of behind us now, like thinking about that. But um, we have had tremendous entrepreneur slash hustle panels the last few years. It's been my favorite part of the event, like I've already said. But this panel with these two and then the engagement with the audience is exactly why I'm so happy to be back in person. So thank you for all being here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about maybe some lessons learned. Um, what lessons learned might you share with the crowd based on anything and any of your experiences? So um, a lesson I learned was to just, like Nancy said, take a step back um, because as a small business owner, my business is my baby. So initially I just didn't want a lot of changes. Um, I started with, uh, with, like for instance, Wrapped in My Roots, I started with Velvet and um, I kind of at first didn't want to try other materials like the satin or, or silk um, But I had to learn that it's okay. It's okay to change. It's okay to add different things I was scared that my vision was gonna get lost. I was scared that if I expanded it I would I wouldn't be true to myself, but there's a way to be true to yourself and, and still continue to grow um, another thing was uh, getting um, criticism or just um, negative feedback. Initially, I just didn't really like that. But then I was like, okay, for me to grow, like whatever people are saying, if it's something negative, I can take that and apply that to my business and, and let my business grow. Like I don't, you don't have to look at negative feedback from your business as something that you're doing wrong or feel like you're being personally attacked. Just make those adjustments and take that feedback and, and just like use it as a stepping stone. So... Ooh. So for me, it's partnership, partnerships. Um, Entre Bank, shout out Melissa Johnston, uh, Twin Cities Film Fest. I thrive off of partnerships. I, I bug everybody. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be my friend and we're, we're in this together. I, I believe that people is what make your business. And I believe that we can't do it alone. And my customers can become your customers. Mm -hmm. Your clients, no matter how flir fluffy, fl you're shedding, man. <laughs> <laughs> that might just be sweat seeping through. <laughs> no matter what, it's, we, we can really exchange, interchange, and really build bigger communities of great consumers if we talk to each other more. So that, that's kind of what I've learned this year, and I have over... I don't know, 500 partners right now, and they all love me and feed me. <laughs> and also, uh, the next thing is um, banking. Build a relationship with your bank, at least for a small 
Mm -hmm. um, black owned business, that's what I've learned, is to really get close and learn uh, and get that feedback because there's so many complaints that, you know, there's no funding, et cetera. But once you sit down and start learning things and asking questions and not taking no for an answer, you just, everything just comes to you. So I'm, I'm learning that this year. Um, and I'm really grateful for the partnerships and for the lessons. Yeah. Ah, I love this panel. <laughs> you can touch it. This thing's a hit. This thing's a hit. Trust me. Um, okay. So uh, we're going to start to close out. So let's leave the audience with one piece of advice you'd like to share. Susan, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, so a piece of advice I would leave everyone is don't be afraid to start that business. If you have a business idea, work on it, um, get it started. There's going to be people that uh, you would expect that would support your business, but they might not, and that's okay. Make sure that you're going into business for the right reasons, not to have your family or friends cheer you on, because sometimes you're not going to get that. But remember why you started and keep going, keep moving forward, never give up. Um, another thing that I wanted to say is in terms of uh, being a business owner, I was so scared to start my business because I thought you had to reach a certain level of perfection or like a Pokemon you evolved, but sometimes <laughs> that doesn't happen and that's okay. So um, I'm a person that I just get into it and then I work towards my goal and so far, so good. So, yeah, two businesses and more in the future. So, if we're talking animes, then I'm a yeah. Give her a clap, guys. Yeah, don't don't miss it. <laughs> if we're talking anime, can I be like Goku, Super Saiyan? Anybody? All right, forget y'all. Do I look like the kind of guy that's gonna edit you? No, 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 no. I have two pieces of advice. Okay. The first one: go on BlackBusinessEnterprises.org right now. <laughs> and support us. Uh, the next one I would say, man, you guys are missing out on so many customers. Uh, there's 98,500 Somalis in Minneapolis. Many of them are not being marketed to. Shame on you. I said what I said. Uh, there's a ton of honesty. There's so many customers, but you're not thinking of marketing to them or selling to them. Uh, they got money too. So that's my piece of advice is don't count us out. Because we, we're up and coming, and we, we have it as well, and we want to be sold to. I mean, I could say no, but I want you to ask me. <laughs> so that is, that is my piece of advice is uh, broaden your horizons. Come to my events. You know, I have uh, hip-hop music, a little bit of Afro beats. <laughs> you can wear your Why do you look at me all nervous <laughs> when you say that? <laughs> no, because I don't want you to come with this coat. <laughs> I have, a, I have another full-length green coat I could wear We will fashion police you <laughs> <laughs> so bad. But that, that's my advice. Just expand your horizons. You know, I love this room. It's, it's, it's quite diverse. I want to see y'all where, where we are as well because we, we are great clients too, and we, we want to expand as well, and we want to be your customers as well. And I want you to be my customer. So thank you so much for having us. So without a doubt... You guys can remain seated out in the close. Okay, so I, I, it's hard to even follow that, but we are wrapped up now. So I want to thank all of our speakers. So a round of applause for all of our speakers. And thanks again to a fantastic hustle panel. That There's a reason we close with this. So thanks to these two ladies and congrats. Yeah. This isn't the um, uh, Lord of the Rings finale, so there's not a whole series of thank yous, but another thanks to MCN6, Jack, and JE, who I called out earlier, but they really make this happen, so a round of applause for them. <laughs> thanks to our sponsors, who make all of this happen, and um, have done that for years, hopefully next year too. And with that, we're gonna wrap. So I talked earlier about the reasons that we should all be confident with our businesses. If you have a good, strong, healthy business with a great team, there's still a lot of opportunity for us to move forward together, right? So be yourself, be brave, go make some things happen. We'll see you next year. Slancha. Yeah.